Hi, good morning uh, again uh, to all. Uh, we would like to request all our uh, speakers to switch on your video. Hi, Ong, Likan. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Inaya. Hi, Davina. Hi, Afan. Where are you? <laughs> Hi, hi, Roberta. Hi, Peyong Jin. Hi, Pibia. Hi, Ben. Hi, Shavin. Azmi, can you switch on? And Yuva? Hi, sir. Hi. Ayn, are you, are you available to switch on for a while? <laughs> I know you're on a trip back to, to campus. Oh, I'm sorry because currently I'm using my father's quota internet. So oh, okay, I'm... okay, sure, sure, sure. No worries, no worries. Thank you. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, Yuva, ask me. Yeah, sure. Just give me one second, yeah? Okay. Take your time. Semua dah makan ke? Ya, dah makan. Good. So, anyone from KL? At the moment, live from KL? Me. Me. Ong Zikan. In UM. Yeah. In UM. Okay. Yeah. Pei Yong Jin, in UM as well? Yeah. Okay. Campus. Great. Uh, Inaya, in UM as well? Uh, no, I'm at home. I'm at home. Okay. Marsha? From Bangi? Uh, Serdang, is it? Not Bangi. Uh, yeah, but I'm currently in Johor, still oh, undergoing Johor. Okay. ODL. Yep. So you have someone live from Johor. So Ben, all the way uh, from the north. <laughs> Penang. Pivia, you're also at home or? Yeah, I'm at home in Shalam. Shalam, okay, Slango. Okay, Yuva, I, you, you, you're in UM as well? I know I'm doing internship, so I'm staying at Bangi right now. Oh, Bangi. <laughs> okay. Sure, sure. Okay. Azmi, in UM? Ah, UM. Okay, good. All right. Uh, we're going to have a snapshot of our group photo. Uh, so put up your best smile, yeah? In one, two, three. Hold on. Give me one second. Right, another one. One, two, three. All right, you're good to go. Okay, um, we are going to start now. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning to our speakers and our participants of uh, UM Virtual Youth uh, Symposium on Sustainable Lifestyle 2021. Uh, my name is Fadli once again. I'm a research officer of UM CAS uh, and project co-leader of UM SGU's Challenge 2021. So joining me in this uh, symposium is uh, Mr. Afan Nasruddin and as well later on uh, Mrs. Myrus will join us uh, as well. So on behalf of UM Community Engagement Center, UM CARES, uh, Regional Center of Expertise of Central Sinanjong Education for Sustainable Development, and UM Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, UM SDSN, um, we would like to congrats once again to all our 13 speakers uh, who made it to the final leg uh, of this uh, in this year's uh, challenge. So congrats. So let us recap. Uh, we have chosen the theme for this year's challenge, uh, Sustainable Lifestyle for Sustainable Campus and School. Uh, so the, the pivotal role of youth. Uh, so all these 
13 speakers uh, to, with us today have actually completed their journey with two series of uh, webinars, uh, capacity buildings, uh, two pop quizzes, uh, pre and post self assessments, and uh, as well as the uh, SDG Sustainable Lifestyle uh, Edition Bingo and a brief report submission. Okay. Um, but unknown to them, actually, the, the submission of your brief report uh, is not the end of the evaluation. <laughs> so this is uh, just a surprise to all of you. So today will be actually the final evaluation on which we'll choose uh, top three, uh, top three participants. Yeah, so that's why I always leave uh, any conversation that we have through email or through WhatsApp with which we wish you all the best. So all the best to all 15, yeah? Okay, um, without further delay, uh, please allow me to introduce our first speaker, uh, the, Ms. Davina N. Raja from University of Malaya uh, with the topic, the climate is changing. So are you? Uh, Davina N. Raja is currently an undergraduate student uh, at University of Malaya, uh, pursuing a Bachelor of Education. Uh, in her free time, she's a podcast host of an education-based podcast called Schooling the Podcast. So maybe Davina can share a little bit later yeah, about that. I'm really interested to, to, to learn more about this. Uh, when she has downtime, she enjoys a casual grocery shop and occasional cup of tea. I'm a tea person as well. <laughs> okay, so if you would like to connect with her, feel free to email her. At, uh, I will share the email and contact link at the chat box later on. So the floor is yours, Davina. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Fadli. Just give me a quick second to share my screen and then we can get started. Sure. Two seconds here. Yeah. Okay. Um, just to double check, we can all see my screen, yeah? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, so hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in today. Uh, my name is Davina N. Raja, as Mr. Fadli has just mentioned. I'm a second year student at the Faculty of Education. And my topic today is the climate is changing. Are you? So today I'll give you some insights into the SDG program, as well as um, my understanding or my takeaway from this whole uh, challenge. So let's start with the UM SDG challenge. So the challenge was uh, laid out to us quite clearly early on. We had to attend uh, a webinar series. So that consists of webinar session one and session two. And then we had to complete a, a bingo challenge and then obviously participate in this virtual mini symposium on sustainable lifestyle that's happening right now. So the first webinar was uh, very interesting. We had so many well-established speakers. We had Professor Dr. Zul from the Faculty of Science. We had Engineer Professional Technologist Dr. Yuan from the Faculty of Engineering. We had Ms. Myros from UM Zero Waste Campaign. We had Dr. Sheba from the Department of Geology, uh, sorry, Geography. And so we had so many of these fantastic speakers telling us, uh, laying out very briefly about what climate change is and what the climate is all about, how the earth is changing, what we can do in regards of waste management and sustainable living. So it was very interesting, uh, that first session, giving us a uh, sort of an overview of the whole climate change issue. And then after that, we had a short little quiz session. And then from there, some of us, uh, they narrowed down some of us, and then we progressed into the next session, which was the next webinar. And so in the next webinar, uh, there were more. There was a shift from like the climate change education to more of the roles of youth and how we can create sustainable communities around us. So we had Dr. Sarah from the Faculty of Science. We had Mr. Afan from UM Living Lab Water Warriors UM. We had Ms. Noor Farhana who created Eco Friends Surau, and they had so much to say about the roles of students, about youths, whether it be in schools or university, to foster more eco-conscious surroundings. And seeing some of their projects as well, such as the Eco Friends Sura, was also very inspiring. So after that webinar, we had to take another quiz. And from there, again, we were narrowed down into the bunch of us that qualified for the final challenge, which was the bingo challenge. 
And so the bingo challenge was one of the main highlights of this whole uh, session, if I might say so. So it was interesting for numerous reasons. Number one, it was something that we all had to try to complete. So there were nine challenges, if I'm not mistaken, we, and we all had to complete uh, some of them. If we could, we, we could complete all of them. And we had to do it for seven days, within seven days, and submit a report at the end. So it was not only a challenge mentally, but it was also a challenge physically, because we had to do this challenge actively as well as complete it within the time frame. Uh, so uh, thankfully, in my case, I had managed to complete the whole challenge within the allocated time. So I started with the virtual sustainability awareness session with some of my friends. So we conducted a small group session, a small group discussion. We also had a bunch of activities and things like that. And we sort of discussed how we can all make a difference in our lifestyles and practices and and sort of incorporate sustainable living in our daily lives. So many issues were discussed. We covered a lot of uh, waste management issues. We covered recycle, uh, recycling. And um, amongst the many issues that we discussed, we also discussed the ability or the extent of our efforts towards sustainability. So ultimately, we all agreed that doing the smallest things within our capacity for an extended period of time is better than doing nothing at all. So there were many other challenges that we had to complete as well. Um, this is one of the challenges, as you can see, that is my brother over there, and he's making a pledge to uh, keep his showers that are usually quite long to a brief 10 minutes. And that's a picture of all of us there with sticky notes. And you can see some of the sticky notes around uh, some of the switches in the house saying to switch off when not in use. So this is our sort of idea of a pledge. And then we also have me down there with my water bottle. This water bottle has been with me since uh, forever. I would know that's an exaggeration, maybe two years tops. So uh, I carry this water bottle with me everywhere I go. It is my go-to water bottle. Uh, it helps me because I don't have to constantly buy water and I just have to refill. So um, this was my sort of homage to my uh, long, habit of carrying my water bottle. And then we also have um, the next part, which is convincing my family to switch uh, to paperless utility billing. Now, this was interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, utility billing, sorry, paperless utility billing is not available to every uh, single, it's not available in every single state. So it depends on the certain states in your district. So I doing this made me realize that there were various ways in which I had to navigate to sort of get uh, to a place where I can say, okay, we can successfully uh, transition from uh, paper utility billing to paperless utility billing. So this was eye-opening for me because I was exposed to a lot of the different systems. Um, and then this also recycling as usual, we have uh, me and my family and we are, we are avid recyclers. We like to recycle as often as we can. So uh, this is just us rec practicing recycling at home. Uh, we also have uh, practicing reusable bags. That was one of the challenges as well. So um, because sometimes when we go to the grocery store, we kind of forget that we have to uh, practice uh, carrying reusable bags. It's, it's quite a common uh, for forgetfulness that we have. So um, in, to cope that, we sort of have boxes in the booth and we have bags as well in those boxes. So it's not a matter of, oh, I forgot to do this, rather than it's, it's always then we can always like... Uh, put our, uh, our groceries in those boxes. So this was convenient for us. Um, we also have uh, using energy efficient electrical appliances at home. So this was one of the challenges. And you can see my aunt is very proud of our fridge because our fridge has a five star uh, energy rating. So yeah. Um, so this was uh, one of the final uh, uh, Sorry, this was one of the final recordings, uh, sorry, challenges that we have to do. And this is a video that we had to post on climate change awareness. Now, this sort of solidified the whole challenge for me because this gave me a lot of insights as to the things that were happening around and sort of reminded me of the changes that we are making now through these challenges and how they can affect um, a big and a large scale of things. So uh, just bringing you shortly to watch the video. Just bear with me as you watch the video. Hopefully it works. 
climate change is now rapid, widespread, and intense. Just to double check, can we climate hear the audio? Rapid, yes. Awesome. Thank you. Climate change is now rapid, widespread, and intensifying. It's unequivocal that human activities are responsible for climate change. That's the finding of a new study. A new study says global temperatures are set to rise beyond the target limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius, unless there are rapid and immediate reductions in greenhouse. Climate change is a mass phenomenon that has taken the world by storm. With the Earth's temperature increasing, there's an urgent need to protect the Earth from overheating, costing its inhabitants their survival. That means that many of the things we enjoy doing now could very well be not around in the future. The Paris Agreement has initiated some form of change around the climate crisis, with world leaders joining forces in advocating for a better tomorrow. You can be part of this change too. We all need to do our part in protecting our Earth, opt for renewable energy, use fewer cars, plant more trees, reuse, reduce and recycle and consume carefully. If we all do not initiate change for the climate, then climate change will change us all. Right. So uh, thank you for listening to that. So uh, from all these challenges and doing the video, what exactly did I learn? I learned three things, three main things at least. The first thing I learned is that doing activities with my friends and family was fun because they sort of initiated a lot of the things that uh, the a lot of the challenge ideas as well as the challenges themselves and it was it was nice to do it with a group of people rather than doing it in isolation or as an individual the second thing it made me actively learn about the environment now it's easy to just have um, documents and text about about the environment and climate change and sort of mug it continuously. But this challenge was so unique because it sort of created that element of self-discovery and self-exploration. So knowing, uh, going back to the paperless example, I didn't know that we could, some states couldn't have a paperless uh, option. So because of that, I had to go and research and do different things and look for methods and find ways around the problem. So it made me sort of explore that aspect of energy conservation in a whole other way. And the third thing is that it feels rewarding and it contributes and that feeling of accomplishment, that feeling of, oh, I'm doing something better for the environment is something that I got as I progress and as I ch checked all those boxes for the challenges. And so I thought about these, these gains that I had and I was thinking, how can we sort of solidify this and how can we make it into a cute little package where everybody can sort of obtain it? So I thought about environmental education. So environmental education is probably one of the most important things that we can do right now. Um, we can, it's important because we are learning to care for the environment. We're learning about sustainable practices, knowing about waste management, food management, knowing about recycling, reducing, reusing. It's also important because it sort of fosters the community. So education in and of itself isn't something that you can do in isolation. You have to do it in a community. You have to do it together. There is that interaction. So that togetherness, similar to that that I had with my uh, siblings and my friends and my aunts and uncles, is that it helps make these practices more enjoyable, more fun, more rewarding. And the third part is creating a new wave of community. So when we start from education, when we start teaching our young people that, you know, a uh, sustainable lifestyle is important. In it does contribute to the betterment of the whole globe. It creates a sort of community. It creates a sort of awareness that exists in people. And it, that awareness is sort of uh, something that people can bring and say, look, this is my truth. This is my principles. And this is why we need to protect the earth. So environmental education is something that I sort of want to bring up as my sort of takeaway from this whole experience. Um, but environmental education does exist in Malaysia, but it exists in um, sort of in, a, in, in, in different subjects. We have it in science, we have it in geography, and we also have very, uh, many different initiatives, such as the National Education for Sustainable Development Work Group, where it was created in 2000, 2015, and it provides environmental education through various formal and informal initiatives. And we also have the Malaysian, the 12th Malaysian Plan, 
And this incorporates uh, environmental education into a lot of different subjects. And this was, uh, its successor was the 11th Malaysian plan. And that was sort of when uh, environmental education was introduced. We have this, but it's still not enough, you see, because it's being uh, neatly packaged into to fit molds of subjects that already exist rather than being something that exists as its own unique sort of type of subject. So what can we do better in terms of environmental education? And one, we, we definitely need grants and funding and we need a lot of expertise to create formulated curriculum for students. This means that it cannot just be something that you sort of give information and, and it's there and, and sort of uh, people, students mug it almost. We need to make sure it's fun, creative. We meet, need to make sure it's a uh, wholesome, holistic. That way students have that sort of self-exploratory nature that comes with uh, learning. We, can, we also need to have information and resources regarding biodiversity threats and how to manage that. And so information that is unbiased, information that is not of a specific viewpoint that doesn't propagate certain things, that's what we need in environmental education. And last but not least, we need to know how to respond to certain types of threats, disasters, especially to do with climate change and climate, uh, yeah, and especially to do with climate change, because we see a lot of our states, we have floods and, you know, there's, it's overheating and things like that. We need to know how to cope and how to manage with these changes. And so this is sort of my takeaway and sort of what I want to see in the future, hopefully. Um, so just to end, I want to quickly acknowledge a few very important people. Uh, first and foremost, my siblings, Dania Francis and Diane Noel. They are currently watching right now. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, just to acknowledge that they are uh, the people that sort of have this fun element. And that is why a lot of the challenges were so fun to do. It's because of people like them that make it so fun and interactive. Obviously, uh, my families, my uncles and aunts who taught me about climate change and who taught me about ways in which you can sort of um, recycle, reduce. My aunt never sees something and says, we can throw this. She always looks at something and says, we can do something with this. And she's the person that sort of taught, uh, teaches us how to discard our food waste properly and recycle and reduce. So without all of those fundamentals, I can successfully say I wouldn't be here uh, today as I am now. Obviously my friends, particularly Farah Iza, who has helped me through a lot of the slides and sort of going through my thought processes as well. And also my community to my local grocery store, to my, the recycling uncle that always comes in my neighborhood. And a special thank you to UM and UM Eco Campus for giving me this platform and for allowing me to share my thoughts and my uh, visions for the future. So if you'd love to connect with me, my Facebook and LinkedIn are here. Alternatively, you can email me or type your questions out in chat and I will get back to you. Uh, when I can. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs>
and this is how I can localize it or make it as uh, specific to my students as possible. So the role of teachers in environmental education is very crucial. Uh, so my, my answer would be teachers are very important. They are the people that can condense your stuff and sort of uh, reiterate it to make sure that students are getting the information across. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Wonderful, Davina. So I think uh, oh, that's your one of your sibling, right? That's my sister. Yes. <laughs> oh, your sister. Okay. Yeah. That's a very cool question. Uh, okay. Um, I would love to listen to your podcast one day. <laughs> so please do share the, the the link or whatever the information through the chat box. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Davina. All right. Let's move on to our second speaker, uh, Song Zi Ken from University of Malaya. Uh, his topic would be pains and gains in going green. So his name is Omri Kant, uh, 21 years old, uh, second year Bachelor of Arts, uh, history student from University Malaya. So one, uh, hopefully yeah, one day he will become one of a great historian <laughs> in Malaysia. Uh, currently residing at Telenjaya, Selangor, Malaysia. As a global citizen, uh, he's concerned about current issues. He spent lots of time reading books uh, to get himself updated on latest issues, uh, which develop uh, his eco consciousness. So this paved his way into green volunteerism, uh, such as uh, his Form 6 uh, college's cleanup activity, routine recycling activity at college, and Isaac Kedah and Perlis Green Lantern Titan Summer Project 2021. So to impact more people to go sustainable, uh, he decided to join uh, UMSG's challenge, uh, where he is exposed to new sustainable ideas such as community-based TOD, and his sustainability awareness post uh, managed to attract as high as 76 likes, uh, which shows that the public is more interested in going sustainable now. So over to you, Amzikan. Okay, so hi everyone here. So thanks to Eco Campus for giving me the floor to present uh, to share my views. And I hope everyone is doing well now. Okay, so I would like to share my screen. Okay, so sorry, there's some shoes. Okay, so hi everyone here. So uh, welcome to the Youth Symposium on Sustainable Lifestyle for Sustainability Campus and School 2021. So I would like to present pains and gains in going green because this is something that most people will think about, especially when it comes to survival. So let's see how painful and how fruitful is my journey in going green. So let's see the first thing. When you think of going green, of course you will think, oh, our earth is sick. Yes, why I will say that the earth is sick? Let's see. The glaciers are melting. Let's see, you see this polar bear is so beautiful. He's so lonely on the very small. I think if my finger is as big, I think if my finger is something big, then I think my finger will be perhaps the same size with this glacier. And then the second thing is the rising sea levels. That's why some cities are at the risk of submerging. And then the third thing is the tsunamis are getting fiercer. You see this one at Japan? Oh my God. Before that, everything is so good. And suddenly one wave come in, uh -huh. everything is gone. It is pretty like, I think if we have a, I think we can say this is, the superhero version of the sea. Okay, so the soils are cracking bigger. Let's see. You see, this soil is cracking bigger and bigger. You see the holes nearby the, the grass is so big. But by right, when you have grass, the soil wouldn't crack at this extent. The fairy fo forest. Let's see, you see, the forest should be very green, it should be something green, right? But you see now it became red color. So it shows that we are, the hotter days are coming. You see like nowadays I shave my hair because the weather is so hot that I can't wear it if I have long hair. 
So I'm pretty sure that a lot of people will ask, um, I, I'm just doing fine with my the daily life. I don't see there's any problem to the society. Yes, I don't say that everyone has this mindset, but I'm sure there'll be a small group of people will have this mindset. So let's see why. All this happened because of us. You know, we have a few hundred billions of C, uh, you, you see like this, you're driving, you, you can say that I'm doing fine because I can go to my place. Same goes to the factory operators, the people who chop down trees and also the people who use air conditioners. But in fact, the CO2, the, 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 the hundreds of billions of CO2 being released daily, uh, every year, will release heat to our earth. And that's why we have greenhouse effect. And you say aircon because cool, but in fact, it releases CFC that destroy uh, that is making our ozone layer hole bigger and bigger until you, you can see that when the UV light comes in, our earth is becoming hotter. That's why you can't complain. Wow, the weather is so hot. And then at the same time, you say, and sometimes you are still using a lot of, you are still using air conditioners for a long time and using cars very often. Because of your actions, this caused what we see today. So how to solve this problem? A lot of people will be asking this. It's very easy, I will tell you. I will show you how. So now UN has introduced the sustainable development goals with one of the targets, which is 4.7, which is education for sustainable development and global citizenship. So you can see, I will not really tell the whole thing because we have time constraints. So I will say by 2030, we ensure all learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including among others through education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles. So how we do it? So this will make our impact on others to go green in order to ensure the sustainable mankind, sustainability of mankind. And besides this, we should connect education with other SDGs that are related to sustainability and latest sustainability knowledge because, you know, <coughs> through research and development, we'll be finding more and more ways that, that, that can save our earth better, such as using the tap water rather than the, the rather than drinking mineral waters from spritzers or other plastic water companies every day, which is what I didn't learn before this. So I would like to tell my so because like what I said just now, we should use education to promote sustainability. So that's the reason why I joined UM SDG Youth Challenge. So before this, yeah, I'm like this little girl. They're doing the sustain, uh, sustainability practices in this photo. Yes, I'm doing, I'm always doing a recycling like what the first speaker said just now. She's, she, she's an avid recycler. But I did a very big mistake. I didn't invite more people to follow me because I think that it is useless. And you know, because I'm always facing time constraints, so I didn't care more, more about it. And I think, yes, maybe the earth will become better. Now I'm sorry for my selfishness. And you see later on, yeah, I'm like this man, very distressed because not many people are going green. And I see the climate change has not slowed down. Yes, so I started to think, oh, I think my steps are too small. I can't save the world. So I felt a bit guilty. But a one fine day, when I read the news like this boy, so UM Eco Campus announced, announced that they are organizing UM SDG Youth Challenge. I joined without much hesitation to impact the youth to go green because 
I see, wow, the list of speakers such as the one who is who taught sustainable transport, uh, UM zero waste campaign, Himawa Eco Friends. I felt that, okay, this gave me a new breath of life to impact more people with new knowledge and new concepts. So I will say, a lot of people will ask, so what's the purpose of joining this UM SDG challenge? Okay, I will tell you why. So let's see. Okay, what are the gains from going of spreading green? So the first thing is, for the first way, which is go for greener lifestyle. The first one, if you drink tap water rather than plastic water bottles, you can save 162 grams of oil, seven liters of water, and it's the pollution of from 13 billion of plastic water bottles are based on 2012 data yearly. So you can see it's a quite big amount of essential things that we can use. But later on, I will tell you one more thing. Take a shower. Whereas if you take a shower, you can save 283.9 liter of water for 10 minute shower daily. Yes, this is a very big amount. I'm pretty sure that this will be enough for almost a year when it comes to drinking water. So, and one more thing, in what you buy, I know that most people tend to take a lot of food because they want to feel fulfilled. But if you but eat what you buy, save up a food waste dumping area almost the size of whales that can benefit us better, such as building more houses for us, where you know nowadays you're facing acute housing shortage. And have a meat free day or two. I know most people don't like it because they say meat is tastier. Eating the the vegetarian curry, the vegetarian meat is not so delicious, but I can tell you that if you reduce your intake of meat, your meat intake a day, you can slow down deforestation, 7 kg of grain and 5,000 to 70,000 of water for each kg of beef saved. I'm practicing it now. And I think that it's better for us. As you know, there's so many pity animals losing our houses. Why you want to do that? They didn't do any harm on us. Then please give them a, please let them to live freely. And with rain, you can you see so many essential items are being saved. I, I can pretty sure that a lot of people won't be starving or hunger if the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step from Lao Tzu. Then besides that, let's support circular economy. Okay, so before that, before I join this challenge, this something unknown to it was some this was something unknown to me. But however, once I know this circular economy, it creates value and prosperity. We will recycle waste and reuse resources. It's much better than recycling, where you basically use everything from the waste to produce green products which are non-toxic long life and recyclable. And the production is cleaner as it uses fewer resources. And that's why, as it's something like, it literally is not so complicated, then it provides better service to extend lifespan. And for sure, like when this becomes waste, then we will collect at end of life and we manufacture it and basically the whole process from waste to product product to waste so basically we will produce very little waste to the uh, uh, for our environment and why it creates values it generates increased income as you know it because okay the, the most important so one example is food waste you can make it as compost and it will have extra compost, you can sell it out and you can earn income as well. Besides that, you have reduced resource dependency because you don't need to take new resources. You just take your current waste to create, uh, create value. And that's why you can minimize waste and reduce environmental footprint. So at the left side are the examples of circular economy products. And one of the examples that I stated just now is composting. So 
one of my message to youth is everything I touch turns into gold from Peter Waterman. And this is something similar to the, the King Midas story, where he touches everything and it becomes gold. So, and the third thing is su support sustainable transport. I'm sure we, a lot of people, they know what is sustainable transport, but they have very limited knowledge to it, including me. But after I listened to Dr. Yuan's talk about this, I, I knew the concept of people-oriented transit-oriented development, which is TOD, which is, I would say, is something new in Malaysia because it ensures healthier lifestyle, which you see. The office, the retail shops, basically almost every essential amenities are located very near to the MRT station or the train station is inside that small city. So that's why you need to walk around very far where you need to walk hurriedly at when you are having the hectic life. And that's why your heartbeat will be slower and it's better for your life. And then the second thing is the shared space. Yes, this enhances liability. As you can see, not all cars dominate the road and that's why you can do what you like on the street, but it's, of course, not on the plate, not on the middle of the road where cars are still using. So that's why we have, have more space for you to do your own activities, like walking, selling things, playing. That's why you feel more comfortable and live, uh, and I would say, yeah, and more interesting. And the third thing is active transport. Yes, this saves natural resources such as walking and cycling. Where you do your use, you, you, you don't always need to use car. That's why you can reduce the use of petroleum. And then the fourth thing is public transport, like this uh, example of LRT on Kalan Jaya line. So this is electric. So that's why it won't release us, it won't release a lot of emissions to the sky. So that's why it reduces air pollution. But if this train uses electricity that is generated by renewable energy sources, then it will be better. So my, me my message to youth, youth should support, all, uh, it should support all these ideas and with your knowledge in engineering, uh, built environment, you should contribute ideas to how we should implement TOD, chat space, so that there's one day we can see more and more shared space and people oriented TODs in Malaysia. And then you all should support, should, should cycle more and take more take, tra take public transport more often so that like what I said, there is no supply when there is no demand. So please support this concept and contribute your ideas to it so that when the authorities see there's a demand for this transport, then this transport will become more, it will become a main, mainstream transport for the sake of our environment. So, okay, before that, I thought you all about uh, what, uh, how to go green individually. So now, the most important thing here is if you want to make a, bad, a greater impact among the public, you have no choice. You have to go to the community. So as unity is strength, strength to create a big impact, you have to walk into the community. So one of the ways are teaching students it enables them to learn how practice how to practice green practices. Yes, this is what I got from the, the UM Energy Saving Culture photo, the photo archive. And then besides that, the, this is something more interesting, which is drawing posters enables you to spread great impact in an interesting and mind intriguing way. Yes, because if you don't give the input to the youth, then of course, some youth, you know, they have to rely on mm, the guidance of us to go green. If they don't have input, how are they going to go green? So that's why education is very important. And I will say, <coughs> there's one thing where we can walk the talk is promote sustainable lifestyle through 
public campaigns and activities such as free love sale. Yes, you can see the clothes from the Imara Eco Friends a pre love sale at uh, Federal Territories Mosque. Yeah, so interesting. So this can attract more people to walk the talk when it comes to practicing sustainability lifestyle. And before that, maybe they might think that, okay, I'm going to buy a new shirt from maybe Padini, Brands Outlet, or Aeon. So now they don't need to use any new resources to create, to create their new shirts. So that's why they're practicing sustainability now. And then another, the last thing here is use creativity and innovation to create new technology for the public to save the earth. Yes, I know a lot of youth nowadays are very smart. They know, okay, what technology should we use? Okay, what type of tools should we use to save the earth? Okay, so like this self-watering system, you can just utilize your bottles, your bottles tool to create this self-watering system, maybe by using a whole used hose or others to water this plant so that it can reduce the wastage of water. And on uh, based on my own experience, I also did one eco break by just chucking all my uh, waste uh, wasted used plastic bags into the bo bo uh, plastic bottle, and it is as dense as a brick. If I make more core breaks, I can build a building like Eco Arc in Taiwan. So these are my examples of my go to community photos. Like this, the student workshop that I organized during the Green Lantern title with students from SMK Ibrahim and SMK Convent Alostar. And I this in collaboration with Isaac Kadai and police. So, yeah, photos of me using LED light bulbs. Okay, thanks to the inventors of LED light bulbs for their creativity and innovation. And this is me using recycling, recycle bags. Uh, but, however, you can, can see so I, many. Yes? Uh, yeah, four minutes to wrap up. Wrap up. Oh, they still got four minutes, right? Four minutes, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so. I'm sure. Yes, you can see how beautiful, how many, how many, I would say, yeah, the benefits that I get from going green. But however, there are pains too. Because the first thing is, this is something every human will face. That is too comfortable in comfort zone. Yes. I had this problem too because, like, you asked me, okay, taking shorter showers, but I think. I love to enjoy, so that's why it's a bit hard for me to do that. Then the second thing is lack of knowledge about sustainability ways. Yes, before this, you know, I don't know about community-based TOD, taking shorter showers, and also going paperless utility bills. Yes, because before this, we feel we felt that it's well, because I'm not a person studying in this course, so I don't have much knowledge about this. So certain things I can't do for Earth. And then the third thing is, yes, I'm not an artistic, honestly, I'm not an artistic person. So, not an artistic person. So I'm not confident on my poster and video editing skills. So that's why I'm a bit afraid to participate in the last challenge that requires me to create videos and posters as I worry that I might not impress others. And the last thing is time constraints. Yes, you know, because as a human, we have so many things to do. We have to serve the people. So that's why sometimes I feel that I don't have enough time to produce videos and posters for the public to go green. However, let's see. This is Greta Thunberg, the pretty girl. So let's see what she said to me. We can't save the world by playing by the rules. Because the rules have to be changed, everything needs to be changed, and it has to start today. You see, even she, as a 15 years old student, she can step up from the school and ask the world leaders to change. Why can't? And why the youth can't? So, the way to change is change your mindset. Don't think that you have video editing skills, 
you don't you think that taking long showers is good. No, no, no. We have to change. You want to change it? You must change your mindset first. Only you can take shorter showers and also learn how to create video editing skills and also the go green knowledge. So why? Okay, this uh, the first president of Indonesia, Sukarno. He said, "Give me one thousand men. Men, I've moved the mountain. Give me ten young men. I'll shake the world." So that's why he said, he already said that youth has the power to change. Then why you can't change it? Since you are already in danger, why you don't want to change it? You are hoping for yourself to die first and killing more uh, future generations. So my piece of advice is change your mindset. Just wondering, change your mindset. You will learn more things about new, about going green. And the one step that you make will become the base, uh, will become the, uh, the one step that you make will make a great change in the future. So thanks for listening to my talk and please contact me here, my Facebook, my Instagram, my LinkedIn, and my emails. I hope everyone enjoyed my talk. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ang. Uh, we'll let, uh, just one, uh, let, let me check whether we have a question for our speaker here. All right. Uh, so, uh, Fazi, we don't have any uh, question, uh, question. No, no question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, right, one, one, one quick question for you. Of all the SG challenges that are uh, based on the bingo, okay. which one do you think is the most challenging to you in order to complete it? Um, okay, thanks for your question. So I think that SDG 4.4 4 is the most challenging part because the first thing is we have to produce posters and videos to, uh, to promote the, the green awareness. And the most important, uh, important thing is to impress the public. So that's why I think it is something challenging to me as I'm not an artistic person and I'm afraid that my videos might not be accepted by the public. So that's why I think this is the most challenging part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So maybe uh, in our future programs, maybe we can introduce uh, some artistic programs uh, to, to, to help our youth in order to for them to be uh, more well-versed on, on these particular skills. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Let's move on to our uh, third speaker. Uh, it's Nur Marsha Amani Mohamed Jamil from University of Kebangsaan Malaysia, the sole representative of UKM, uh, with the topics SDG advocacy starts with youth. So Marsha is actually a final uh, year law student who is extremely motivated to learn new things uh, and develop her skills by participating in various discourse and online courses. Uh, so she advocates uh, for lifelong learning opportunities and has great tolerance and respect for differences. So being passionate about research, she has co-authored two research papers at the age of 17 and 19 years old and is currently working on the third paper as an undergraduate in the field of thought law. So maybe we can learn a, a bit more on this thought law for those who didn't uh, didn't know about this. She's also a theater enthusiast uh, who believes in the healing power of arts for mental well-being and is recognized for her two award-winning theater productions at uh, National University of Malaysia, UKM. So aims to be a holistic person. She takes up several leadership roles and volunteerism, both locally and internationally as a way to give back to the community and playing her part as a global citizen. A wonderful works you have here, uh, Marsha. So over to you. All right, just making sure is everyone uh, seeing my screen? Yes. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, thank you so much, firstly, to Mr. Fadli for the introduction. Um, allow me to start my session with a folk song that I'm sure almost all Malaysians uh, grow up listening to. Oh, okay. <laughs> rasa sayang, hey, rasa sayang, sayang, hey, hey, lihat nona jauh, rasa sayang, sayang, hey. Buah cempedak di luar pagar, ambil galah, tolong jolokkan. 
Saya budak baru belajar kalau salah tolong tunjukkan. Uh, Assalamualaikum and hello everyone. My name is Marsha and I will introduce myself as a lifelong learner from uh, Johor, Malaysia. Now, um, as much as the title speaks for itself, to be honest, until last year, I did not understand what SDGs were and I did not see the point of advocacy at all. I was too caught up in the red race, especially coming from a gifted education background to the point that I um, lost the spark and joy for learning. So eventually, I decided to take time out of college and to spend more time on myself and reevaluate my interests. So after some soul searching, I was very fortunate because months leading up to this day, I've had the opportunities to meet um, and work with um, different uh, kinds of people from various uh, and diverse uh, background. So the turning point really started when I participated in the Youth Environment Assembly in February. Then I was featured in the SDG Global Festival of Action in March and eventually got to work with the International Union on Conservation of Nature in April. So uh, they really opened up my mind on how do I want to spend my time on earth? What's really important to me? Um, where do I see myself investing my time and energy in? So, um, because I believe with a clear sense of goals and values, our mind and uh, body can be much more resilient when it comes to the stresses of change, especially today in the era of pandemic, um, with climate emergency, and you know, who knows what, what post-pandemic uh, holds for us. Now, um, along with UMS Digi Youth Challenge 2021, I also recently just concluded the Anatomy of Action Challenge with the United Nations Environment Program. As both of these programs is to promote a sustainable lifestyle. And what I would like to highlight from all these cathartic experiences of sustainable living is that there are so many things to learn outside of the classroom walls. You know, I never got the chance to learn about sustainable lifestyles in law school. So it was through these um, online programs that I realized how important each of our roles was to protect our planet and everything inside it, no matter how little the impact uh, is. As the old saying goes, berdikit-dikit lama-lama menjadi bukit, or sikit-sikit lama-lama jadi bukit. But let's not take it in the literal sense like this. You know, landfills, garbage hills full of plastics, food waste, nappies, um, clothing, electrical appliances, and the list goes on. Just, you, you just name it. My point is um, to build better and move forward after COVID-19, we need to start rethinking how we eat, how we move, how we live, and redesign all these systems that underpin our decisions as consumers and producers, both in our personal life and at work. Because positive daily changes, though small, will definitely add up to make a big positive difference. The world needs hands to help, and you may just be able to contribute and make it a better place by making changes one day at a time. It's going to benefit us, our community, and it's a great way to promote the change we expect in the world. So lesson learned number one, it starts with you. Now, what was my biggest challenge in taking up a sustainable lifestyle? Yep. Family, my family. Um, if you think I was unhappy there, I was just kidding. Uh, the picture has nothing to do with my advocacy. I just um, like to destroy a good looking picture for fun. But back to the topic, um, I remember there's this one time 
I asked my mother to buy me a cream from the pharmacy. Uh, it was just this small box, if you can see, just like the size of my palm. So you can, uh, it's something that you can just hold or put it in your pockets, right? So she came back with the cream in a plastic bag. So I asked her, um, why would you need a plastic bag when you can just put it in your bag? And she replied, that's exactly what she said. Are you campaigning with that kind of smirk on her face, uh, but not in a negative demotivating sense and not to badmouth my mother? Um, essentially, it was meant to be a joke. But I think that's a good sign, actually, because that means she noticed something. She noticed the change in my belief and my attitude. And she actually got my message right without me having to say it out loud to her, you know, to stop using plastics. Besides, I'm sure almost everyone can relate to this. You know, sometimes when you go out there um, and meet some older crew, older generation who doesn't want to be called out by someone younger than them. Uh, if you meet people like this, instead of being demotivated, why not engage them in a conversation and see why they feel this way? Maybe they have some old uh, misconceptions that can be addressed or a negative experience that you could both learn from. And let's be real. Change is difficult, particularly lasting change. When our routines become automatic, change does jolt us into consciousness, sometimes in uncomfortable ways. It is hard to stop doing things that one has been doing for a very long time. That's why they call old habits die hard. The good news is that we humans can change any of our behaviors with some degree of sustained effort because we are creatures of habit. I believe that's why the old adage, melentor bulo, biarlah dari rebungnya, or strike the iron while it's uh, still hot. Uh, I think the, um, the old saying still resonates so much in today's world because yes, we need to inculcate good values at an early age. It is very, very crucial. So there goes my lesson learned number two. It starts with youth. Along this journey, I was absolutely amazed by the number of youth around the world that are mobilizing the change to achieve the sustainable development goals. And that includes the work done by our dearest organizer and webinar speakers from both series. Thank you so much for planting the seeds of change in me and everybody else. Let this be a reminder for every SDG advocate that you are not alone on this journey towards sustainable behavior change any behavior change is really a clear and linear path. We may get lost, question our choices, but the key is accepting that we make mistakes and still learn from them. If you're someone new uh, to the area like me, don't let all these 17 goals overwhelm you. SDG itself is a holistic concept that is interconnected. So start with one to three goals that are very close to you and start building up yourself and your advocacy from there in, and spread the knowledge in um, ways that best suits you. And let's remember that history is full of movements led by youth and students. Some are working behind the scenes, some are taking it to the streets, some are speaking out at the forefront with policymakers, but all of them essentially are working towards challenging the status quo and making changes to improve our quality of life. To me, youth symbolize transition, literally from childhood to adulthood. So let's embrace transition and see changes as opportunities to live better for ourselves and the planet. It is completely okay to create new behaviors at your own pace, but try to do it in a sustained manner. At the end of the day, the clock is ticking, which means the earlier you take action, the better. So start today. And um, maybe next time when you become parents and have your own children, or maybe you become an educator uh, teaching in school, or just simply being put in a role model position for children and young people around you to look at. 
teach them this song. Rasa sayang, hey, rasa sayang, sayang, hey. Hey, mari kita sayang alam, sayang alam, hey. Rasa sayang, hey, rasa sayang, sayang, hey. Hey, mari kita jaga alam, jaga alam, hey. With that, I thank you. That's that's very very interesting to even we, we even have a celebrity here. <laughs> Anyone else would like to differ? Okay. Um okay, we have one question. Over to you, Afan. All right. So Marsha, congratulations on your uh, amazing achievement. <laughs> so okay, there's um one question. Among all the programs you have joined so far, including the current SDG challenge, this program, which program is your favorite? The most one. The Ooh, most um, memorable. That's, that's very difficult. But I would say um, the Youth Speak Lab, when I was volunteering with uh, the International Conservation of uh, International Union on Conservation of Nature for the uh, Youth Global uh, Summit because I, I joined them when I have very zero knowledge in climate conservation, uh, climate emergency and you know um, environmental conservation, but they were very, very supportive and they invite me with open arms and yeah, just being open and free to teach me um, the very basic of SDGs and um, it's it's it feels like a very welcoming because um, you know every day it, uh, when when you have adults who give you chance to keep learning every single day and yeah building you up uh, from zero instead of looking down on you you don't know something you don't belong with us because you you're not from environmental background, you're law student, you're, you don't belong with us. So yeah, I think that's um, a very memorable experience and that that actually like lights up my interest more in uh, climate emergency. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Marsha. Uh, there's one, <laughs> another, can you write more as a science songs? <laughs> Sure, sure. I'll share you, uh, with uh, with you the lyrics in the chat box. Do you have a <laughs> single song that you, that you have already released mm -hmm. somewhere? <laughs> no, but I have one song that I translated from English. If you know the uh, La La Land movie, ah, okay. The City of Stars. Mm -hmm. So I translated uh, the lyrics into Malay, but it's not um, about environmental conservation, uh, but essentially something about yeah, space, stars, something like that. Yeah, it's awesome, fine. Awesome. Awesome, Marsha. Maybe we can uh, invite you uh, for another program <laughs> in the future. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marsha. That's wonderful. All right. Let's move on to our uh, fourth speaker, uh, Nur Azmi Lawrence from University of Malaya. Um, his topic will be on plastic pollution and how to reduce plastic waste. Uh, his name is Nur Azmi bin Lawrence from Sarawak. Uh, he's currently pursuing a degree at the University of Malaya, majoring in Bachelor of Environmental Studies, uh, Faculty of Science. As an environmental student, um, he's deeply committed to attaining the SDGs. And even as individuals, uh, he believes that we can contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. We can, for example, live a more sustainable lifestyle. So every effort, in his opinion, would be fruitful. So over to you, Azmi. Uh can you hear me, Mr. Fadli? Yes, Mr. Oh. Yeah, let, me, let, me, let me present first. Is it there? Yep. Oh, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, University Malaya and ICA Campus for giving me the chance to talk. And then I want to thank you, sir, Mr. Fadli, for introducing me. As you mentioned before, I am not Azmi B. Lawrence and I'm majoring in environmental study in University Malaya. So today I'm going to share with you guys about plastic pollution and how we can handle them or reducing them. So first of all, you guys must be wondering, what is plastic pollution exactly? Who 
plastic pollution is a accumulation of plastic objects and small particles of plastic in the Earth's environment that greatly affects the wildlife, wildlife habitats, and us human. So in this slide, you guys can see on the left side, the beach is polluted by plastic waste. So this is what I meant by plastic pollution. And did you guys know that plastic lifespan is near to minutes to hour? Let's say, for example, we go out and then we buy mineral water at vending machine, and then we finish the water in one hour. So we can say that the lifespan of the water bottle is only one hour until we throw it away, right? We are not going to keep it because uh, we the price is very cheap, like one ringgit per bottle. So we're not going to keep that bottle. However, that plastic bottle, when you throw it away, it persists in the environment for hundreds of years. So the lifespan is one hour, but it may take up to hundreds of years until the plastic bottle completely break down. This is because in the plastic, they contain uh, additive that making the plastic bottle become more stronger, durable, and more flexible. And since 1950, researchers believe that more than 8.3 billion tons of plastic has been produced. That is so many. And every year, 8 million tons of plastic waste are escaped into the ocean. And this is very visible on developing countries in Asia and African countries. Since there were a lot of plastic products being produced from 1950 until now, you guys must be wondering, right? Where do all of these things go after, after they serve their purpose? Like, like I told you before, the plastic bottle, after we finish the water, we throw it away. Where does it go exactly? So according to uh, National Geographic, 12% of the waste are being burned and then only 9% are recycled. So where is 79%? This 79%, they end up in landfill and then after that, they end up in the ocean. So if you think the world are really doing the good step in handling all this plastic no we are not we are very on a big trouble right now because 79 percent are not handled with care with proper technique when all of these plastic waste end up in the ocean they actually doing harm to the animals in the ocean for example in this scenario we can see the turtle is eating the plastic bag the sea turtles. This is because the sea turtle thinks that the plastic bags is jellyfish because they have the same physique. So when sea turtle consume plastic bag, they may actually suffocate to death or even if they eat the plastic bag, it will cause chemical problem in their body. It may affect their DNA, they affect this health. So even if survive eating one plastic bag, in the end, you're going to die. Except that this is a whale shark. This picture is taken in Yemen near Aden. This is a whale shark which eating zooplankton. You guys can see on the left side, there's a plastic bag beside. Uh, even in this picture, it doesn't show that he consumed the plastic bag, but in real life, they have chance on soil, soiling it and microplastic as well. But the main concern here is, is microplastic because it was so small and they actually consume it. And day by day, they're going to die because of the chemical reaction in their body. Other than that, this is picture of bottlenecks dolphin in Hawaii. This dolphin like to play with these plastic figures I don't know why, but I think maybe it's kind of like toy for them, but they are playing with the plastic things. And the harm here 
is when they might get uh, disfiguring them or get struck struck by them. So it may cause like turtle just now, they may suffocate to death. And then on this scenario, is a, a seabird actually is already dead and rotting away. But you guys can see inside his stomach, there's a lot of plastic waste that he consumed before because he thinks that that is food. So, or when he actually catching fish, they accidentally consume it. That's why he is dying because of all the plastic waste that he cannot digest. Not only animals, us human also facing problem because of the plastic pollution. But unlike animal, we are not consuming the whole plastic actually. We are consuming the microplastic. What is microplastic? Microplastic is a smaller component of plastic, around uh, smaller than five millimeters, and they exist in the ocean. Microplastic existed because of the floating waste plastic in the ocean. When they are exposed to UV, the breakdown make uh, the breakdown of the float of the floating waste will become smaller, and this is called microplastic. And then this microplastic were eaten by zooplankton. Zooplankton after that eaten by fish, clams crabs and other productive fish. And in the end, this thing ends up in our food on, the, on our plate. So if you consume too much of this microplastic, it may cause cancer to you. So as a youth, we should take action now. I mean, even if we didn't take a uh, large action, we just do small things because I believe doing small effort is better than doing nothing. First of all, what we can do is we can reduce, use less plastic. This is a very simple one. We uh, consider on using something else. And then this one, I know you really like to eat fast food, especially me. I like to go to the KFC, McDonald's, or any other type of restaurant. As a youth, we can contribute to the environment by dine in, except of take a uh, take away, because if we dine in, we are going to use the cutlery uh, there, and if fast food, they need to pack it with plastic, so. Technically, we are reducing the plastic waste. And then another step is by reuse. So this one is very good. Lah. When you are going to the shopping mall, please bring your own bag, your recycle bag. Like me, when I go to Mid Valley in KL, I always bring my Guardian bag and my uh, village grocery bag. Plus, it fits more items in it than plastic. Plastic costs you like 10 cents, right? But this plus, uh, like recycle bag only costs you one ringgit and you can use it until it broke down. But plastic, you only use it once. I mean, like you won't use the same plastic to another more, right? And then the second one is using your own calorie. Uh, like me in University Malaya, when I go to the cafe, I bring my own spoon and fork because I don't want to use the plastic one. Same goes for bottle. Lah. I usually bring my own bottle because if I use the plastic one, I know I'm going to throw it away later on. So I'm trying to contribute to the environment. And I think you guys should do the same thing, even though it's small, but at least we are doing something. Every effort will be paid off in the end. The next one is we recycle. Uh, by recycling, we can reduce the 
amount of resources that we are using. So technically, by reducing the resources of we are using, we technically reducing the waste that are being produced because we are using back the things that we are throwing away. So go for recycle gang. And the other step will be do not litter. This is one of the most important thing. Do not litter because plastic may take up uh, to 400 years to break down if you leave it in the environment. So do not litter. Another way is by promoting sustainable lifestyle in social media. Uh, by doing this, we can increase the awareness of taking care of the earth. So keep sharing posts about sustainable lifestyle, keep sharing things that might give positive impact to the environment. Uh, before I end my talk, I want to share with you guys a video actually. This is a uh, human. The, I think you guys, some of you have already seen it, but let's just play it. Uh, Mr. Fadli, can you hear the sound of the video? Uh, no. Hello? No, no. We, we cannot hear the, the sound. How should I share with the sound? Huh? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe you can stop sharing and then uh, when you want to share your slide, please click the share sound, share with sound option at the bottom of the... Oh, share sound, okay. Yeah. Is there some now? Yep. All good. Okay.
okay that video show us all the waste you guys can see in the video there's a lot of waste produced so that would be us in one day if we don't tackle all the plastic pollution and all the other pollution so thank you for listening to me and thank you to eco campus Nijimaya and mr fadi that's all from me thank you awesome awesome uh, me. Uh, that's very interesting video that you shared with us seems like we are watching a short film <laughs> on the weekend so over to you afan Right. Uh, I mean, we have. Right, we have few questions. Okay, let me just pick one. Um, few. Um, maybe from Siti Marasia. Can you recommend there any other movies documentary about plastic pollution? Uh, I'm not sure about movies or documentary, but I usually read about plastic pollution on National Geographic. Uh, City of Russia, you should check uh, on their uh, official website because there's a lot of there and they are very precise with all the details they are giving like what from what I read like usually these all these plastic waste end up in the ocean they usually came from river actually and all these river are majority in China for like young I don't remember the river name but they're actually from the river actually and then in the end they end up in the ocean so if movie or documentary i'm not sure but you should definitely check their website national geographic just type plastic pollution and then national geographic all right thank you thank you uh, asmi so that's the end of your session all right let's move on to our next speaker uh, speaker number five, we have uh, Ms. Naya Umaira Faizu from University Malaya as well, uh, with her topic, Green Technology, uh, Understanding the Climate Crisis. Uh, she's actually a second year chemical engineering student uh, from uh, Faculty of Engineering University Malaya. First runner up, five minutes manifesto for STEM, uh, Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics leaders on revamping the use of green technology in Malaysia and a green technology advocate on subjects related to affordable energy. Uh, interesting. So over to you, Naya. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Fadli. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, so for today, I, Inaya Omaira, will be presenting about uh, green technology and understanding the climate crisis. Okay, uh, wait, I'll just share my screen. So, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, just a little bit about myself. Okay, um, first of all, um, can you guys hear me? I'm... Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, this is just a little bit about myself. So, I'm a uh, second year student uh, studying uh, chemical engineering in University of Naya. And I'm also a second place winner for the five minutes STEM manifesto challenge. Uh, and one of my manifesto was to revamp the usage of green technology in Malaysia. Uh, and I am uh, also a green technology advocate. So, so, um, as a speaker for today, I also joined all of the challenges uh, from the first webinar of the SDDU challenge up until now. And but for today, I uh, I think it's um, uh, why not I share uh, more about like my knowledge and my understanding about that I have gained about climate crisis and also apply that. Um, uh, to the green technology part of uh, uh, my knowledge, since I am also a green technology advocate. So these are just the topics for today that I would like to uh, share. So bear with me. So first of all, in order for us to come up with better solutions, we have to understand the root of the problem. So um, these are two reliable sources of 
a definition of climate change, uh, which is from the UN FCCC, Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, by the UN, and also the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So uh, climate change may be due to natural or internal processes or external forces, such as uh, changes of the solar cycles, volcanic eruptions, and persistent changes in the composition of the atmosphere. Okay, so you can you guys can search, uh, read more about these definitions from the uh, from Google, so and from the website of UNFCCC and IPCC. But um, for today, to just make it simple for all of you, climate change uh, refers to the long term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns due to natural effects or human activities. So bottom line, uh, that is. Uh, what climate change means uh, in simpler words. So um, currently climate crisis has taken over climate change and this is a new phenomenon that we need to deal with uh, due to the fact that um, uh, human activities have been increasing and we need to compensate with the rising population. So, But what is climate crisis? So climate crisis is a situation characterized by threat or highly dangerous irreversible changes to the global climate or it is a way to describe that the climate change is widely spreading and intensifying across the globe. So uh, an example of intensifying climate change is through rapid increase of greenhouse gases. So based on the graph, as you can see, there are three main types of greenhouse gases that have increased exponentially after the Industrial Revolution, which is around 2000, uh, 2007, 2010. Um, which shows that our climate change is uh, tends to be permanent uh, because of the fact that now we have to deal with a time constraint because it is very difficult to uh, reduce the rate of pollution the same way it has increased. So since um, all forms of energy uh, cannot be created or destroyed, so energy will circulate. But when there is an uh, increase in the rate of pollution means there is an imbalance of energy loss to the environment in the form of pollution. So when this rate is too high, it is very difficult for us to reduce it um, based on the time that it has increased. So in short, um, the more pollution we cause, the harder and longer it would take to restore the climate balance. And most of these energy losses occur in form of, in form of pollution which is not most favorable for uh, useful energy circulation. Okay. So this is just another graph to show that human activities contribute most to global warming compared to the natural processes. So uh, there are many solutions for climate crisis and considering time as being a new constraint in handling these issues, it is most necessary that we plan and act urgently to reduce as much waste and pollution as we can. So as accountable citizens, we can practice sustainable lifestyle, such as practicing 3R, separate ways, uh, and be involved in knowledge transfer within the community regarding climate issues, uh, such as this uh, symposium today. So congratulations for all of you that have attended. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of other solutions viable as well. And this is definitely something that you can Google and read about more on the internet. So uh, it includes improved farming, protect and uh, restore nature, apply green, uh, green building concepts uh, in town management, uh, use less transportation. But um, another solution that I will be focusing on today will bring me to the second part of my presentation, which is uh, the use of green technology in solving climate issues. Okay, so um, first of all, what is green technology? So we need to know what it means first, right? Before we can like delve deeper into other uh, topics about it. So green technology is a uh, technology or development that can be applied to various fields, products, or manufacturing methods in ways that can catalyze useful energy circulation and reduction of pollutants to environment. So there are many forms of green technology that are currently used uh, that are common, uh, which include, so you can see on the picture, solar, uh, wind power, hydropower, geothermal, uh, biomass, and biofuels. So, so besides six most common forms of green technology, there are various other new technological advancements that help reduce pollution tremendously, which include uh, okay, developments of plastic roots, uh, which has been proven to reduce carbon footprint by 72% and was initially developed by Dutch companies in 2019. 
and uh, apparently uh, plastic roots also resolve the uh, plastic pollution problems because these roots are made from plastic and we know that uh, plastic pollution has been increasing as well so this is uh, actually a very good viable solution for um, uh, climate crisis and next is you know 3d printer for bricks so this is just a printer that layers cement to produce bricks for building that use uh, much less cement and create much less waste we also have transparent solar spray which is a transparent spray on solar film so uh, there are nanoparticles in this uh, uh, in this liquid um, that when you spray it onto windows uh, it is the window is um, straight away converted uh, into like a solar window you know so it uh, based on just liquid spray on film so this is actually very unique um, technology and next we have a uh, power leap energy footsteps which is a piezoelectric floor tiling system so what it does is that it converts energy from human foot traffic into electricity and it was developed by a company a company named power leap. okay so next we have solar windows so developed by solar window technology uh, which are windows that can generate electricity um, but as far as I'm concerned this um, uh, technology is still in R&D stage and uh, but it has been proven to be more efficient in generating electricity compared to conventional solar panels so we should definitely look forward to this uh, solar window so these are just examples of recent technology uh, technological advancements that has not been widely disseminated but can resolve energy situation and solution problems. So uh, it is important for the youth to have awareness and know about recent advancements so that uh, we can urge the implementation of these technologies and we can catalyze uh, production for uh, cheaper alternatives so that more people can use these technologies. So, so uh, the significance of uh, green technology or in other words, the importance of green technology. So the main significance of green technology is to find the means to produce technology in ways that do not damage or deplete Earth's natural resources. So other significances uh, include ensuring R&D, research and development for cheaper and affordable green energy in the future. So right now we have discovered green technology, but then the question arises, but how can we resolve the issues with uh, uh, the price problem, pricing problems, because green technology is expensive and not everyone is support, uh, can afford it. So this is another problem that we need to resolve in the future. So in terms of study, you know, for this studies in green technology, it's definitely necessary to analyze methods to produce green technology that is affordable, to increase findings and research to come up with more useful and efficient uh, system that generate less pollution. And we can also broad uh, broaden the green concept uh, through various sectors and policies uh, so that um, uh, the green concept, more people are aware about this concept and more people uh, can apply in their daily activities. So, oh, sorry, uh, main importance of green technology for future developments include uh, increase the market trends in affordable technology usage uh, in green technology like I said earlier, and also to increase investment in green technology. So while also being able to reduce pollution, green technology also boosts performance of economy through a circular sustainability concept or sustainable circular economy. So this involves designing and promoting products that last and that can be reused and repaired and manufactured. So um, this concept retains the functional value of product but recover the energy of material so that it can be con uh, used continuously. So, um, so this concept uh, uh, can also increase um, the economic activity uh, because uh, all of the remanufacturing and uh, business models based on reusing, uh, leasing or repair actually need uh, labor work. So it can also increase the economy by providing more jobs for people and engage local uh, economic activity. So um, green technology uh, also can catalyze security sustainability, which also boosts um, country's economy in a way. So it's not only important for uh, 
the environment, but it's, it can also be beneficial for the economic development. So how to better implement green technology? So these are just uh, the main um, steps of technolo technological change. So um, we have to understand uh, the technological change, first of all, uh, to better implement the usage of green technology. And the biggest challenge is to avoid uh, skepticism surrounding the third and fourth stages, which are adoption and diffusion, because um, a lot of companies are still afraid to uh, invest in green technology market, as the demand is not that high. And um, implementing this technology would require understanding from companies and authorities about the technological change, so that uh, they can adapt to the uh, to the current climate crisis effectively, and we can uh, change our approach in fostering uh, technological advancement in the matter. Okay, so uh, we can also better implement green technology to green technology education. So uh, to ensure the demand growth in green technology, uh, it is crucial that education and knowledge transfer is provided to people about green technology. Uh, because the basic is uh, when more people are aware about this, the more people will try to incorporate these technologies within the lifestyle and increase demand for green technology in global markets uh, so that we can catalyze production for cheaper alternatives. So, um, green technology education uh, can be uh, implemented in schools to expose uh, students based on the green concept and how uh, it is implemented in real life and then to uh, education at university level could include exposure to industries and also authentic experiences that involve industry mentorship, guest speakers and meetings and all that. So these things are what we can incorporate in our education system so that people are more aware about the technology. Okay, so uh, relevance of green technology. So we can really summarize the importance of green technology through the success of the Clean Air Act, which is an act that has been established in the US since the 1970s, which uh, with the purpose of uh, implementing more green technology and green policies to reduce air pollution. So, as you can see, based on this graph here, um, the concentration of pollutant average for all types of pollutant in the US has decreased tremendously uh, since the implementation of this act up, un up until 2018. So, this actually highlights that green technology is actually effective in reducing pollution. Uh, and it is actually needed to help reduce environmental problems apart from the uh, in the future. So, um, the use of green technology in our daily life supports motion and prosperity activities, but in context of reduce, uh, reducing pollution and increasing its availability, uh, it's strongly in line with SDG 7 and SDG 9 of the Sustainable Development Goals, which are affordable and clean energy, as well as industry innovation and infrastructure. So SDG 7 targets that by 2030, modern energy services should be made affordable and there should be an increased use in efficient and renewable energy worldwide. While SDG 9 targets that by 2030, to enhance uh, inclusive sustainable urbanization and support economic development and human well-being um, with a focus on affordable and equitable access for all. So therefore, we can see that um, based on these two SDGs and these two targets, the role of green technology is definitely relevant because it definitely fosters um, uh, technological advancements, especially in terms of uh, producing uh, more affordable green technologies in the future. And so, okay, I would like to invite uh, all of you to visualize climate change with me because uh, visualizing climate change is important because it can also help raise the awareness. Because some people, when you just um, you just tell them the facts, you know that um, pollution has increased uh, from this uh, percent to this percent, from this to this, this, they would just take it as it is. They will not be like, they would just feel like maybe, oh, okay. Uh, but if you show them pictures, and if you say that, oh, this is the graph, this is the picture, this is how it looks like people can actually get more awareness from it. So that's what I want to do with you all today. So, um, so as you can see, based on this uh, graph, this is the graph of Climate Change Vulnerability Index against the Annual Change in Population. 
And um, you can clearly see at least half of the population worldwide is at high to extremely high risk of being vulnerable to climate change by 2030. So by 2035, sorry. So um, you can see that actually um, at least half of our population means at least half of the entire uh, people on this earth, which is not a uh, little bit, it's, it is actually a lot of people. So at least half of us are still exposed to high to extremely high risk of um, being vulnerable to climate change in the future. So uh, this is actually very scary to think about. And this is a comparison of the average global temperature in 1960 and 2020. So we can actually see there is a lot of difference in temperature and how hot our Earth actually is right now at the moment compared to this decade. So um, this actually explains that Okay, the global warming issue has been um, very serious. As you can see the, uh, from the picture, the blue regions represent colder regions and the red ones represent hotter regions. And you can see how hot our Earth is for the past year and compared to 1960. So, you know, it gives us uh, more insight on, uh, to ponder upon our uh, daily activities and you know, our actions, maybe we need to change some things and uh, some behavior so that we can help reduce this problem. And I hope that by visualizing it, um, we can understand better how serious this uh, global warming is. So uh, these are not definitely the only ones, but more can be, you know, more of the visual um, or graph. Uh, you, you guys can search that uh, in Google, in the internet, but these are just um, some examples that I uh, would like to show. And also, uh, the last thing I would want to share is the hashtag show your strikes movement. So this is a movement that initially started from a visualization created by uh, Ed Hawkins, a renowned data scientist from the US, from the trend of increase in average global temperature. So you can see this is the graph, okay? And this graph is converted into this kind of like strap abstract. So this, um, uh, change uh, climate change data visual, uh, visualization has taken the uh, world by storm actually uh, and it's been turned into various forms of art and it has actually became a, move, uh, a movement worldwide to spread the awareness about global warming so these are examples of people from the government who have been um, joining the movement uh, you can see it has been changed into typings and all that and masks and these are people from uh, various backgrounds uh, from countries uh, like uh, Paris, from US, from uh, Madrid and all that. So, and these are people from the media. So for uh, any one of you who are still aware about it, so it's still not too late to hop on the trend because it's never too late to change for the better, right? Okay, so that is it. Okay, so uh, before I end my presentation, I would like to just share a quote with you guys. Um, okay. Sustainable behavior is the basis for sustainable advancement. So this quote is a quote that I live by. And I think it's important for all of us to actually realize that um, technology is only a form of assistance to human beings. Okay, uh, better technology can never be as revolutionary as better humanity. So we should keep that in mind, that in order for us to change uh, the climate crisis, we have to change ourselves. And that is through practicing sustainable behavior. Okay, so that is all for me. I hope you all have gained some input about climate change and green technology. And you guys can apply it in your daily activities. And of course, a lot of what I have uh, showed you guys um, just now, I have gained from the webinar sessions from the SDG Challenge that I've previously joined. And uh, if any one of you is interested to exchange opinions with me uh, regarding green technology or any topics uh, related to SDG, uh, don't hesitate to contact me via my email. So uh, I'm open for discussion. So that's all for me. Thank you. And uh, don't forget to think green. Okay. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, Naya. Um, over to you, Afan. 
All right, Inay, uh, there's one question from Sharil uh, Izwani. Uh, in your opinion, how the manufacturing of green technology can significantly reduce the carbon footprint in the world? Okay, so uh, green technology involves uh, a lot of uh, studies in various fields. So there is this uh, one field in particular, which is uh, called uh, green chemistry engineering, which is actually a field of engineering that I hope to pursue in the future. Um, green chemistry engineering actually deals with a lot of uh, sustainable uh, methods for sustainable processing. It means that uh, when we process or manufacture some products, our products especially are involved chemical, um, we, uh, the green chemistry engineering sector will find a way how to actually reduce the amount of pollutants in these products. So um, that is why um, that is one way that uh, how uh, green technology advancements in manufacturing can actually help reduce carbon footprint. Because when there are lesser pollutants in the products manufactured, uh, we can definitely reduce significantly the amount of um, pollutants that is, that is uh, released or that is disposed from the factories. So uh, one way is through uh, green chemistry engineering or just generally green chemistry in general because uh, it deals with those kind of uh, methods and processes. So yeah, I, um, that is my answer. I hope I answered the question. Awesome. Thank you, Naya. Okay. All right. Okay, let's uh, move on with our final speaker for part one. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to have Sivia Ravindran from University of Malaya um, on her topic, My Sustainable Lifestyle. She's an actually uh, an undergraduate student from Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences in measuring in international and strategic studies. Currently, she's doing her internship at Climate Action Leisure, or CAMI, K-A-M-Y. I've been actively, uh, she's been actively volunteering in Water Warriors, uh, Rimba Almu and ProHam, and also a facilitator of UM CARES and UM STEM. So her passion is rather interconnected between sustainability, environmental science, arts and culture. So without further delay, I'll hand it over to you, Sivia. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Fadli, for the kind introduction. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. My name is Tia Ramirvan and I am an undergraduate student from the University of Malaya in International and Strategic Studies. So my topic for today is about sustainable lifestyle, which I am keenly passionate about. So moving on. So my journey towards sustainability begins with this 17 colorful SDG boxes. So it simply reminds me of Rubik Cube. So it is complex as Rubik Cube, but it can be tackled if you know the tricks. So it is a very explorative basis. And also what is most interesting about uh, SDG is that you are more into it and you'll be learning a lot of things that you do not know initially. So talking about solid waste management. So out of that 17 SDGs that I am quite overwhelmed about, I am quite fascinated with solid waste management. It is because I've like recently participated in Asian Environmental Student Platform 2021. So that's where my interest towards solid waste management is kind of like started. So that was the moment where I tried to learn more about solid waste management. I see waste as an innovative tool to make world a better place. If you could reduce or minimize waste and have an effective waste management, you could definitely make world a better place to live in and reduce the environmental issues that we are facing today that includes climate um, change as well as environmental destruction that we are talking about just now. So bringing that, what can I do or what can we do? So this is a question that I always ask myself. And before I ask that, I always assume this, that you need to have a greater one. You need to know why you are doing this in the first place, because if you do not know the reason, you could not sustain for a very long term. So speaking about that, everything starts with awareness, followed by educating and also advocating yourself and also the people around you. So as for me, opting for a sustainable lifestyle is where my overall awareness begins. And sustainable lifestyle is like you walking 
walk the talk and also taking action according to your own needs. So that's where government or international organization or private companies don't meddle with it and you can do things at your own needs. So it is totally up to you. And as for me, I've been a very active participant and practicing lifelong learning. So it all started in University of Malaya, where Sayyidinis Gram, my muscle semua um, program yang ada. So I kind of like go in for every programs that organized by University of Malaya. So in the beginning, I don't have a single idea what I am going and looking for. So learning international and strategic studies, it is a very diverse uh, course study where everything fits in. So you tend to learn a lot of things and it is quite overwhelming also. So that overwhelmness, I try to educate by going into virtual platforms, physical platforms, and learning more about it through online courses, webinars, workshop, and so forth. So once you are being like very actively participating, you initially try to, you initially start to organize physical or virtual sharing sessions and also projects. It just comes to you naturally. So when you're doing that, you will be able to do lots of networking and also learn new things. So that is very crucial, I believe. And being also a former preschool teacher, I think that we should not only focus on youth solely to teach things. As mentioned earlier, habit dies hard, right? So everything starts when you are in small age. So never undermine children and also teenagers what they can do. Usually this is a very handy tip. When you say that you want to organize a social project or also you want to ask permissions from your parents when you are in school or you say it is kind of easier when you are like a grown up and also go into a NGOs and also work for private companies. So that's one thing that we need to remember. And talking about social entrepreneurship, or we can even call it as a green entrepreneurship that is becoming very widely taught, spoken about. So this is where people tend to be more innovative and creative with their products and also their services that are sustainable and also that is beneficial for the social needs. So it also strikes into a circular economy and also promote a better sustainable opportunity for all. And eventually once you are like having an adequate amount of awareness, education, and also this advocacy experience, automatically you will be going into a more serious conversations and also more serious involvements like in policy making, legal reformations if you are a lawyer, and also you try to even participate in international platforms and organizations like United Nations or and even uh, ASEAN. So that comes naturally as well. So, Speaking about that, let's walk the talk. So what can we do to reduce this environmental impacts and also how we can promote this sustainable lifestyle? One thing that comes to our mind is zero waste lifestyle. So zero waste living is not as easy as we could think of because it has its own pros and also its own cons. So I started zero waste lifestyle at a very minimal basis where I tend to use a lot of reusable items. And I also purchase items in bulk and also try to avoid impulsive buying. So being a um, funky item collector, I used to collect a lot of things and also very much into shopping spree as well. So that's where when I learn about zero waste lifestyle, I tend to discipline myself of not buying too much of things that I don't really need. And that is a great experience and also learning for me. And it is still ongoing. And speaking about zero waste, once again, the most important thing that comes to our mind is the practice of 3R, 5R, and 7R. So 5R and 7R is just an extension of 3R. So where this reduce, recycle, and reuse is like a basic thing for you to do. So before we move on into this 5R and 7R, which is far more efficient, definitely, but we need to look into this 3R. Let's try with something basic. First. Let's take a total step before we move on into this complex five hour and seven hour thing. But it would be really great if you could just leap the step and move into this five hour and seven hour. So on my left, you can see a family picture. So that's Lauren Oberon and her family. So she's from uh, Harvard, Australia, and she is 
really educating her family on zero waste living. And they have been doing various sustainable methods according to their family's name. And um, interestingly, they also have their own websites called Spiral Garden where they share all their activities and also their ideas on sustainability, which we all can check out later on. Yeah, moving on. So zero waste living, as I mentioned, kind of boring if you see very closely and um, it could be like you can be like very demotivated if the people around you are not focusing or not helping you in doing it so you can tend to lose your purpose of doing that so coming from an asian background so i believe each one of us have our own set of cultural practice and also tradition so coming to that indigenous traditional minimalism is one lifestyle that can be an alternative for zero waste and also it can be incorporated into zero waste and make things more unique and interesting for you to practice so it is not like very much like straining yourself oh no you have to be in zero waste so it gives you like possibility endless possibility for you to explore so speaking about indigenous lifestyle it is all about coexisting and have a better appreciation towards nature so this idea can be, we can learn from the indigenous people itself, but that's the sad part due to the deforestation and also the environmental destruction that we are facing today. I'm afraid that we might be losing their lifestyle, which is a very much uh, adaptable to the nature and also a very sustainable one as well. So just pick up things that you find it interesting and relevant to your lifestyle. And speaking about traditional lifestyle, once again, it is just a follow-up of our ancestors, cultural traditions, and way of life. So you don't, you have to look into the past or how people tend to live without using plastic, just by using clay pots and also by using metal fans and stuff like that. So they would be, they had a very sustainable lifestyle. But you ask them personally, especially your grandparents, they would say they lived in poverty. But for me, it was a fascination, but for them, it was a poverty. So that's the difference between them and us. So, um, so in my opinion or in my practice, I think that cooking is the most efficient way to practice traditional lifestyle because um, you can use clay pots to make things more tastier. And also if you use this um, grinding stones, pestle and mortar to do your um, everyday cooking ingredients, it would be like less efficient. You will be using less electricity and also it will be more efficient in terms of sustainability as well. And minimalism, speaking about minimalism, it is something that um, every youngsters would be looking into. So it is more on a modern and contemporary lifestyle, which you can practice every day. So speaking about that, once again, it is it has a very deep philosophical meaning in such that not everyone of us, I mean, everyone of us not be unable to be forever. So we have our timeline, right? So that brings us that we need to have a single line or a clear line between our needs and luxury. So that's where minimalism comes place. And in recent architecture and even interior designing, minimalism is becoming a very big thing as well. And uh, you can see bottom there, you can see like two, four pictures that are stated. So minimalism, I get this overall idea from the documentary that they had in the Netflix called Minimalism. So this two, boys or I'd say two men are uh, software engineers and they advocate on minimalism across the United States. And it is a very interesting documentary, highly recommended to watch. And um, Marie Kondo, Marie Kondo is also a very prominent figure in uh, United States and Japan especially. So her documentary is also in Netflix. So her idea about sustainability is very much visible where you need to have a joy when you own things. You need to have a better appreciation of what you are owning. So if you have waste, how you should segregate them, how you should prepare things accordingly, it's something that she thought <laughs> according to the Japanese value, but it can be customized or also can be internationalized according to your own belief or your own system. And Martha Stewart, she is a very um, 
interesting and also famous personality back in the United States as well. Her show was like something my grandmother loved to watch. And um, I get lots of ideas about sustainability from her website. So she has an endless list of sustainability tips and also ways to promote it. So bringing that pop culture and sustainability is something that we tend to overlook. So incorporating pop culture, uh, uh, sustainability into pop culture makes you uh, things more easier. It gives a wider awareness to people across our region and also across the world. And entertainment, fashion, food, and consumer products are few pop culture medium that you can use to promote sustainability. So overall, it gives you a better idea to engage with people and it gives a better practice of sustainability, which they are not forced to do sustainability as a need. So it would be like automatically they will be involved in it. And moving on. So that's all from me. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation. But the thing here is I would really suggest that everyone need to take the right action so that things are more persuasive and also sustainability is not stuff as we tend to look into. It can be practiced if we know the right method. So that's all for me. Thank you for listening once again. Awesome, Tivia. Uh, is there any question for Tivia? Currently, no, Fazli. No, okay. Uh, I have one question. Uh, for you, Sylvia. Oh, uh, over to you, Afan. All right. Um, so there's a question from Queen Emily. Um, Japan rank 15 among 162 countries for their achievement of SDG, according to SDG report 2019. What's your thought on this? Okay, thank you for the question. It was a great question. Okay, Japan is a saturated developed country in such that they have been a very popular state and they have their own cultural practice and also popular cultural practice that they have been practicing for years. So speaking about sustainability, I can give you a very good example of this Kamikatsu village in Japan where they practice zero waste lifestyle. So the whole villages, they practice zero waste lifestyle where they have a single recycling center and also they segregate recycling items into 45 types of recycling items. So that was a very fascinating uh, success story in Japan. And the government of Japan is like kind of initiating that method into all parts of uh, Japan. And they have been quite um, successful in that. But still, they have their own flaws on doing it. Where they, since they are very cleanliness-based uh, society, right? So they are very cultural-minded and also conservative types. So they tend to overwrap things. I noticed that they tend to overwrap things. You can really check them out in YouTube where they, due to cleanliness, they like kind of wrap a single banana into a single plastic bag so that when anyone touch it, it is not contaminated. It is like okay to eat. So that's one thing about Japan. So but they, are, they have been doing a very good job in sustainability uh, development goals and something that Malaysia should emulate about. It's my take on your question. I hope I answered it. All right, thank you so much, Lydia. I think that's uh, about it for your slot. Okay. Moving on. Um, we will not take a five minutes virtual coffee or tea break. Uh, please, uh, you, you may now uh, take a, a five minutes break. Uh, please enjoy the music performance by our friend from Faculty of Engineering University of Putra, Malaysia, UPM, Ivan Chua Chi Wai. Okay, so we are going to resume. Uh, we're going to be back uh, in five minutes time. Yeah. Thanks, sir. See you later.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, since we are a little bit back, uh, I mean, overview of the, of the schedule. Um, so we would like to uh, resume. Uh, we would like to continue with our seventh speaker, uh, Ms. Narayan Zainal Fitri from University of Malaya. On her topic would be youth and sustainable development goals. Please allow me to introduce her, yeah? So, She's actually a third year student taking Bachelor of Science in Biotechnology at University of Malaya. Uh, also one of their participants for uh, international program, uh, same with Fidia, Asian Student Environment Platform 2021 under Aeon uh, Environment, where students uh, from different countries in Asia shared their country's efforts in waste management and sustainability. Uh, she also enrolled in an outbound program by Common Purpose Organization, where she, uh, she learned more about uh, advocating the SDGs, especially the ones that she's interested in. Uh, she's passionate in spreading the awareness and the need for better efforts and more knowledge among the youth and community to achieve the goals for better Malaysia and the world as a whole. Uh, for your information, uh, currently Nur Ain is with us, but at the moment she's on her way back to uh, UM campus. So she has pro uh, prepared uh, a pre-recording uh, sharing session. So let me uh, share it with you. Share it with you guys. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning and a very good day I bid to everyone who is present here in this mini symposium, UM Virtual News Symposium on Sustainable Lifestyle 2021. First and foremost, I would like to thank University of Malaya, UM Community and Sustainability Center and UM SDG Youth Challenge 2021 team for organizing this challenge and program as a medium for the youth to learn, advocate and challenge themselves in living sustainably and to promote the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. My name is Nur Ain, and the topic for my sharing session today is Use and SDGs. Based on the United Nations Development Programs website, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, also known as the Global Goals, were adopted by the United Nations in 2015 as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that by 2030, all people enjoy peace and prosperity. The 17 SDGs are integrated. They recognize that action in one area will affect outcome in others, and that development must balance social, economic, and environmental sustainability. Countries have committed to prioritize progress with those who are furthest behind. The SDGs are designed to end poverty, hunger, AIDS, and discrimination against women and girls. The creativity, know-how, technology, and financial resources from all of the society is necessary to achieve the SDGs in every context. I only started to know, learn, and indulge more in this topic around early this year. Meanwhile, 
The SDGs have been around since 2015. This had opened my eye on how I was five to six years late to learn about this and to start doing my part in achieving these goals, even as an individual. This had also made me realize how this topic is very much still not well known in our society, including the youth. These goals are there for us to be able to live in a better world and to achieve them, everyone will need to play their part. And before they do that, they will need to know what in the world this is about and what they need to do. The youth is an important part of the society. We are the future leaders and we have a lot of things to learn in order to form an outstanding line of leaders and become an integral part in promoting a better nation and world. Hence, let's start now. It is never late to learn something new and to start doing a good thing. The more people, individuals especially us, the youth, who started practicing and advocating sustainable lifestyle, we can surely see the changes that we so much needed and desire. I started to know more about SDGs when I participated in an international program, uh, Asian Student Environment Platform, ASEAN 2021, where nine countries in Asia participated. In my group, students from different countries explain about their country situation in managing their waste and some other sustainable ways that they do for their waste management. This program has certainly added tremendous amount of knowledge about how we can introduce development while keeping sustain sustainability in mind. I have also learned that discipline and the cooperation of all parts of the society are compulsory in achieving a clean environment, for example, in recycling. This program, like UM SDG Youth Challenge, targeted the youth since they believe the youth can be the leaders in their community in spreading the knowledge and values about sustainability. After that, I also enrolled in an outbound mobility program, global citizenship program by Common Purpose Organization during my semester break, in order to ensure that my leisure time was still spent wisely. In this program, the, st the students were exposed to the SDGs and how they can step up as a responsible global citizen and address and lead the global issue that we are passionate about. This program also enabled me to develop the core skills, capabilities, and insights to support myself as I look to further, to further the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This, this provided an opportunity for me to draw upon the rich diversity that exists across several universities to benefit from insights and learning from young people, students and change makers, and to earn the global citizenship micro credential. Lastly, I took upon another initiative in my journey of, S of SDGs by participating in this UM SDGs Youth Challenge as I'm becoming more and more interested and passionate about these goals. Watching the webinar series gave me more insight on how wide this topic is and that the seriousness of the issue is something that we should not look away from. During the period of completing the mini individual project, I faced several challenges that made me realize how little I have done to live sustainably and that there are so many other things that I could have done earlier. This mini project shows that there are many opportunities in our life where we can try to easily change and practice sustainable ways or methods such as using energy efficient electrical appliances and by reusing food utensils and packaging. One of the activities for the mini project bingo is to pledge on taking shorter showers. To be honest, I am very much guilty of taking long showers. After this challenge, I have been consistently shortening the amount of time I spend in the bathroom and this has also helped my family to reduce water usage and consequently reducing the cost of water bill. I have also started practicing to immediately switch off any electrical appliances after using them so that I will not forget and eventually leaving them until someone else or I myself realize about it, hence already wasting a lot of energy.
However, there are a few sustainable lifestyle activities that I have always been doing for the past years, which include using eco-friendly bags. Whenever I go out, I will always make sure that I have the foldable eco, eco bag in my sling bag, or if not, I will fold and bring reusable plastic bags if I could not find my eco bags. Uh, other than that, I also have stopped using plastic straws and have had my own metal straw, chopsticks and other utensils for a long time. I am also planning to use my food container as much as possible whenever I'm buying takeouts or doing takeaways so that I can reduce the tendency on using plastic containers. When, when I return to the campus, it will also be easier for me to continue practicing recycling as there are many sites or locations where I can find recycling bins. But the more important key is to reduce the usage and reuse what you have as much as possible so that the less thing could be thrown or needed to be recycled. Last but not least, I would like to call upon and urge everyone, including the youth out there, whether you have only known about this just now, or you are still new in this journey, or you have already been here since forever to, continu to continue your role as an active global citizen by living sustainably and by being the leader of your community in spreading the awareness of SDGs to the people around you. Save the environment towards a better, cleaner and prosperous world. That is all from me. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Ayn. Um, are you available to take up a question? Uh, hello, uh, sorry, I just reconnected. Um, did my video just ended. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, currently, I think my connection is stable. Okay. Uh, any question for Ayn from the floor, from our audience? Currently, no, Fazli. Uh, no question, yeah? yeah. I have one question uh, for you. Uh, Ayn, uh, by, look, by participating in our UMSU Challenge 2021, uh, if you are in my place as project leader, what, what component or what part or what element uh, from this uh, challenge, uh, challenges that you have, uh, took part would you like to change in order for, uh, in order for it to be more interesting for our youth? Um, I think in my opinion, yeah. I would like to add more um, in, in the bingo challenges, right? I would like to add more like activities that maybe they can do so that maybe um, there will be more activities that they, they can do less because I, I think maybe for them, there are certain, for example, uh, for my experience, I don't really have enough, I don't really have enough um, appliances and, and energy saving appliances. So that's why I could not do the activity for that part. So maybe we can increase uh, the number of different activities for that. All right, you're referring to our bingo, yeah? Yes, that's right. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. So that's all from Ayn. So okay, let's move on to our next speaker. Ms. Roberta Rinuka Lazarus from University Malaya. Uh, her topic is very interesting uh, and very unique, vegetarianism and veganism. So let me introduce her. Um, Roberta Lazarus uh, completed her bachelor's degree in environmental science and management uh, from Faculty of Science with uh, first class honors from Nipsi Malaya, currently pursuing masters in engineering sciences. And she's keen to spread awareness and bring changes to the world. And she has turned vegan herself uh, to reduce uh, carbon carbon footprint and believe everyone can cut, cut off meat, uh, cut meat off too. So to save the world and discourage such an ethical industry. So she loves uh, volunteering and cleaning sites and also urban gardening. Uh, so it is serene and awesome to see the germination of seeds into green plants. So uh, very green at heart people. So over to you, Roberta. All right, thank you for the introduction. I would like to share my slide for now. So can you guys see my slide? 
Yes. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Roberta. So um, I am going to touch on this topic, vegetarianism and veganism. And this is actually something to do with SDG 13, that is climate action. And I'm going to like tell you guys how our diet actually brings a big change to our climate, actually. So first of all, I would like to emphasize that climate change is real. But there are some people who actually don't believe in climate change. They actually think it's a hoax and merely it's for business purposes, such as him. I'm not going to pronounce it. <laughs> so um, he actually even withdraw from Paris Agreement back then because um, he doesn't want um, America to follow those carbon restrictions. But researchers have actually found out that carbon dioxide is actually shooting up, especially since um, Industrial Revolution, that is 1950s onwards. But the problem is not that carbon dioxide is being emitted to the environment, but it's actually that it's happening so quickly that it's going uncontrollable right now. And we are actually on our way to achieve three degrees Celsius in average temperature rise by 2100. So three degrees Celsius may be a small number, but it's actually a huge change to the world. So it may be irreversible and we are going to go through so much of um, terrible damages and detrimental effects. So first of all, before moving on to the diet part, I'm gonna just uh, touch a little bit on this ra Amazon rainforest. So for your information, rainforest, we have two types in the world. One is a tropical, one more is a temperate. So Amazon is the largest tropical rainforest, meaning it can sustain itself. So it is two times larger than India itself. And 10% of all the species can be found in this beautiful rainforest. So, and we are actually, we all know that there is this current issue going on where they're actually chopping down trees in Amazon rainforest itself. So the sad thing is that 20% of the trees are actually gone by now. So um, what we're actually really scared of is that we will reach a tipping point very soon that is called the rainforest dieback. So this means rain, tropical rainforests actually survive in a way that through evaporation, they actually produce those clouds and the rain would actually water this greenery and flourish. But if trees are actually being cut down, there'll be less evaporation, there'll be no rainwater, and the entire rainforest will not function. So that is what we are super scared of. That is a rainforest dieback. Means it will no longer function as a rainforest itself. Okay. I'm gonna like tell this fact now. Deforestation and agriculture actually contributes to more greenhouse gases than all the transportations combined in the entire world. Yes, that includes the ships, the planes, the cars, lorries, everything combined. It's actually lesser compared to the amount of greenhouse release due to deforestation and agriculture. So the figure here um, is kind of really shocking. 90% of deforestation is actually done for agriculture and also cattle ranching. Cattle ranching means they actually cut down the trees just so they actually have a huge land to grow the cows, sheep and everything because they need a huge land to survive. And in this world currently we have more than 1.5 billion cows, okay, for those marketing, okay, where they can actually sell and be slaughtered and provide as food for products and stuff like that. But the issue is not the cows, the issue is that the gas released by these ruminant organisms they should release methane gas. Methane gas is like 20 times more potent compared to carbon dioxide, meaning it is more persistent in our atmosphere and it traps heat, okay? So just imagine the carbon dioxide plus the methane gas, it contributes to a quicker um, climate change effect. According to the United Nations, farming and the meat production contribute to 18 to 25% of greenhouse gases. That is one fourth of all the greenhouse gases produced um, in the entire world. So it's actually a huge problem, but nobody's actually talking about how our diet could actually change. So now let me just tell you some of the effects of climate change that we could actually see right now. So why I'm actually using climate change instead of global warming is that some people they might think, oh, it's not, um, the world is actually not heating up because some countries are cooler compared to last year. That's the thing. Some parts of the world are actually colder. Some parts of the world are hotter. It's happening unevenly. That is why unpredictable weather. This unpredictable weather is actually one of the effects of climate change. And next, melting of glaciers and ice sheets. This is super scary because when the glaciers and ice sheets actually melt, the sea level will actually rise. So when the sea level rises, there are so many islands and coastal side regions that are actually going underwater very soon. 
as you can see in the YouTube, Jakarta is actually already seeing um, water seeping through their roads. So Jakarta is actually um, kind of, they're actually in a dangerous state. And some other countries to name are Bangladesh, Vietnam, Myanmar, these are the countries that they have to be super careful. Even mega city like Tokyo might be underwater very soon because of this rising sea level. Next, varying rainfall pattern, it's unpredictable too. And also extinction of species. By 2050, scientists have actually predicted one um, third of all the organisms are gonna go extinct, but I won't be shocked if it's gonna happen earlier because Paris Agreement is kind of like not going successfully, but it's all um, the role of everyone because I believe nobody is too small to bring changes. So let me now talk about diet, vegetarianism versus veganism. So I would like to just um, differentiate so that you guys know the differences between these two first. So these two um, kind of diet is actually a great way to reduce carbon footprint. Vegetarian are actually the people who avoid meat and fish, but they consume dairy and eggs meaning they still contribute to animal cruelty in a way because dairy farm also kill many animals for their dairy production. Vegan are people who actually cut out every item of the animal um, origin, meaning they don't even um, support things that is actually made of leather. They don't buy things made of silk, wool. They don't take honey, eggs, and also like vitamins containing animal byproducts. It's a no because vegans are people who want to go something to, um, they want to like actually consume things that are actually more ethically produced and sustainable. So what are the benefits of being vegetarian or vegan? One is you will actually lose weight, reduce chance of heart attack, cancer, and so on. So I personally became vegetarian like three years ago and vegan like one year now. So what I could actually see is the changes in my skin, okay, because dairy causes inflammation and you get acne. So I had terrible acne back then, but now it's better, thankfully. And I feel lighter, I've lost weight and stuff like that. But the only pitfall from this diet is that you will need to take vitamin B12 because this vitamin can only be found in animal protein. However, that's not an issue because vitamin B12 comes in vegetarian or vegan capsules, which we can take. However, I'm not taking, but I'm still alive. <laughs> so how vegans help the world? Okay, so I'm going to like tell some shocking figures right now. So by 2050, we know that the world is going to be like populated by 10 billion people. So I believe we are all aware of that. So we will need to produce 60% more food to actually feed everyone in this world. And according to this figure, we will be producing way more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Okay, just imagine, okay, the forest being cut down, okay, animals actually being grown to the time when it's actually slaughtered, imported, exported, reaches to your plate and stuff like that. These are the kind of thing, okay, there's going to be so much of carbon footprint along the food supply chain. So if the whole world goes vegan, according to a YouTube that I actually watch, three quarter of the greenhouse gases can actually be prevented from being emitted worldwide. Okay, it's actually a huge change. And deforestation worldwide can be drastically reduced. That's obvious. And people who can be fed than raising cattle. Okay, so I actually got these questions from people saying, oh, okay, so you're vegan. You're also contributing to climate change because um, there are actually crops being grown like the soya and stuff like that. Yes, Amazon rainforest, right? They're actually chopping down trees to actually grow these animals and also for soy plantation. But for your information, it's actually a small um, impact to the um, done by the vegans compared to the meat eaters. Why? It's because 75% of the soy is actually grown merely to feed the animals, not the humans. Only 25% goes to human. And 1 billion tons of grains every year is produced just to feed the animals, not humans. Meaning if we are not focusing on these animals and to feed them and to let them grow quicker for profit, we could actually feed 3.5 billion humans, okay? With the 1 billion tons of grain every year. Meaning we could end poverty and also end hunger. Okay, so these are some things that is actually kind of shocking. To grow one kg of cow, they will need to feed 10 liters of grains. To grow a pig by one kg, they will need to feed them with six liters of grains. To grow chicken with, um, to grow chickens by one kg, they will need to feed uh, with four liters of grains. But they're not merely feeding them with 10 liters, six liters and four liters one day. They're feeding them by hundreds of liters, okay, for them to grow bigger. And once they grow bigger, it'll be more profitable. They can be chopped off easily and be sold, stuff like that. 
So actually by going vegan, you could actually save about 5 million liters of water yearly. Let me tell you why. Can you see the picture with the steak on it? Yes, that plate of steak actually has about 330 grams of carbon dioxide that you have emitted um, indirectly without you knowing. Okay, that's what I actually say. From the time when the forest actually cleared, okay, to the time when the animals actually grown with huge amount of grains, water, and then it's actually chopped off, imported, exported, and stuff like that. So that is actually how um, detrimental the entire system is. Okay, and some people, they might be thinking, oh, vegans are too extreme and stuff like that. So um, people might be um, telling me that, oh, how can just I change the diet, um, be contributing to climate change. Actually, I'll just stick to this um, quote Greta Thunberg actually mentions, nobody is too small to make a difference. So some people may not be convinced, okay, that animals, by eating this meat, you will actually um, impact in a positive way towards climate change. So I will try to like bring to another side. That is the real marketing, the reality. Let me tell you the reality of the animal industry. So these animals, they are actually deemed as fresh meat, fresh fish. Nothing is fresh. As mentioned before by Noor Azmi, um, yeah, microplastics is everywhere in the sea. All the fishes that you actually eat, they do have particles, microplastics already. So that is why humans actually say, to consume, to breathe, to even drink plastics nowadays. So it's already everywhere. Next, these farm animals, they're actually um, injected with high doses of hormones, antibiotics, and drugs to be alive because that's a reality. They want these animals to grow um, huge over a short period of time. So they're not going to care about your health or my health. It's all business and money. So the next thing is milk. I've always heard this thing, fresh milk, fresh cow milk. No, it doesn't exist. Milk has got millions of these cells, poo cells. And as you can see in the picture beside, that is actually the reality. That is how they're extracting milk nowadays, okay? In these huge industries where it may even be wounded, those bacteria can end up in your milk. And who knows what viruses and bacteria um, may actually evolve later on, just like coronavirus. So next, this meat is actually cholesterol rich. There are also toxins, okay, filled with toxins, and you will have a higher chance of arteriosclerosis, meaning heart attack and stuff like that is so common if you have to eat this kind of um, meat, because as I mentioned, it's all filled with these hormone stuff. So that is why people are having a hormone imbalance and dying of diseases, illnesses, and stuff like that. Now, this figure is kind of scary, but it's the truth. 80 billion land animals are actually eaten every year. And some of the movies that I would recommend you to watch, okay, so like the Cowspiracy, Seaspiracy, okay, you could see how unsustainably the meat industry, those um, ocean, right, how they're actually exploiting these fishes and stuff, but they're just deeming it is a sustainable fishery and stuff like that. Actually, nothing is done in that way because it's all business tactics. Okay, that's all for now but i would like to share a video if you guys will permit me because it's kind of disturbing but i would like to know if you guys want me to share it or not do comment first <laughs> okay, i'll just stop sharing this first so do you guys want me to share the disturbing video i see some yes <laughs> all right yes please Okay, it's a little disturbing, but just bear with me. These are the kind of videos that make me cry. Okay, this is a reality, okay, of animal industries. Super disturbing, so yeah.
So it's just like this. Okay, I think I'll just stop because it's kind of disturbing. So, yeah, so let me get back to presentation. So that is what I actually have put down there. Her screams will actually haunt you. So I actually wanted to go vegetarian at first because I wanted to just reduce my carbon footprint. And I actually knew that this steaks, this meat is all actually, um, if I'm to go for a right choice, then I could actually help the, my environment in a better way. But then later on, I realized that what's the point if I'm to actually see my animal friends dying, right? Because I don't like humans have this mentality that they're superior compared to animals. So that's why I actually shifted, like I went vegan. Although both veganism and vegetarianism, they actually have kind relatively low um, carbon footprint compared to other diets. But I actually chose veganism because of humanity. And I just hope that that video, the reality would could actually show you what it is actually like and how do animals actually suffer outside. So it will be a great change, I hope. That's all, thank you. If you have any questions, do let me know. All right, over to you, Afai. All right, Rebecca, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, there's one question from Queen Emily. Can an enemy person practicing uh, vegetarian or veganism in terms of protein or and vitamin B12? Sorry, I couldn't hear you well. Can you just... Can an enemy person practicing vegetarian or veganism in terms of protein and vitamin B12? Can an, an enemy... Oh, all yeah. right. So yes, I have heard this also. Actually, um, we do have great choices and alternatives nowadays. Okay, they do have supplements that actually merely produce in vegetarian and vegan capsules that is actually um, helping many vegans out there. So yes, no matter what um, Ill, uh, problems you actually have going through, you can actually consult your doctor first. And there is solution nowadays because last time it was really hard to be a vegan. Last time they don't have um, um, example like notice we have the soy meats and stuff like that last time it was super hard to actually get vegan food but nowadays everything is already there you can get it anywhere so there's no excuse actually so it's all about humanity and also for a better climate so yes but you just need to consult your doctor first all right thank you so much uh roberta there's one more question but please uh, answer it in your in the chat box yeah all right thank you all right thank you roberta that's wonderful experience that you shared with us. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our ninth speaker, uh, Shavin Menon, Chandra Menon from University of Naya, uh, with his topic, if not today, when, if not you, who? So Shavin Menon, Chandra Menon is an undergraduate student from University of Naya who currently pursuing second year Bachelor of Building Surveying from Faculty of Built Environment, UM. Uh, he has a strong background on built environment studies. Uh, we'll look for a chance on creating sustainable construction so that uh, we can come up with sustainable lifestyle as well as uh, cutting costs, time, energy, and uh, creating effective habitat. So without further delay, uh, I'll hand over to you, Shavin. Uh, yes, I think I'm horrible. And then, yeah, a very good afternoon a bit to the all members of the floor. So I'm Sharon Menon Chandramanan, a second year building surveying student in UM. And today I would like to share the striking points and benefits that I gained from participating in SDG Youth Challenge 2021. And looking back at my motion of the day, namely, if not today, when, if not you, who? I would like to draw your attention that practicing a sustainable lifestyle is more important than having a healthy lifestyle. It sounds different, but that's the truth, yeah. And firstly, I'm very impressed with the speaker's thoughts and ideas that were presented from our first speaker, Davina, until the recent speaker, uh, Roberta, and it's really inspiring. And yeah, maybe inspiring from last speaker, I might follow a full veganism or vegetarianism in future since I'm a, a occasionally vegetarian. 
So yeah, kudos for Roberta. Uh, thank you for that, actually. So no source, no slides, no videos. It's just me and you. And I'm going to share what's my thoughts and how a person from construction development field approach SDG. The way I'm going to share my opinion is matter. So please stay tuned and listen up till the end. So yeah. As a building serving student who closely observing the evolution of the modern world, I can say that sustainability in construction plays a big role because not just made up of uh, bricks and soils, but it's involving the lifestyle of the future generation. Uh, despite dragging the intro, let me talk more on this from my point of view, which uh, from construction development interrelated with SDG in a short time span. So basically, uh, what is sustainable development? So in a simplest term, I can say that sustainable development can be defined as the social and economic development that meets the need of the prison without compromising on the ability of the future generation need. So at its very core, sustainable development, it's a holistic approach uh, and it does not restrict to the environment, but it also affects the social and economics of a society. So yes, so what's the relation between sustainability in constructions? So uh, based on the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, they known as uh, EPA, uh, they define the sustainable construction as the practice of creating structures um, and using the processes that are environmentally responsible and efficient throughout the building life cycle. So talking about the building life cycle, it consists of uh, uh, siting, uh, designing, construction, operation, maintenance, renovation, deconstruction, demolishing, and so on. And simply it can be classified as pre-construction, construction, and post-construction. Yeah. So the need for a more sustainable ecosystem is greatly required now more than ever. Uh, because ever since the dawn of the modern civilization, the built environment around us has already caused a lot of damage to our ecosystem. More on that. So to be honest, it's such a shame that we as a human being doing such disgrace to our own home. So remember, this earth is just a temporary and we should pass it to the next generation with how we obtain from the past. So or if can, we should try to make it much more convenient to live and not doing things that harm the nature. So talking about the damages and the cost effects and so on. So what's the remedial measures for this? So as a building environment student, I can say that we can use renewable energy such as VRS, VRA, VRF, HVAC and so on and so forth. So developing the efficient and smart technologies in uh, building a new buildings, uh, like minimizing the natural resources consumption in uh, structural materials and so on, uh, using environmental friendly materials for structures, uh, like reducing the timber sources, uh, like deforestation and so on, uh, and also investing in research and education of sustainable structures uh, among the local contractors, or else uh, we can go for uh, foreign contractors too. So the adaptation of sustain, uh, sustainable construction firms, uh, in my opinion, it has increased tremendously over the past few years. And with the new and improved technologies in the market, the cost of sustainable construction has also come down. So in my opinion, I think uh, this is a, can consider as a success, but not a huge success. And it's bring a heads up to the field environment con community to protect the earth from the pollution itself. So yes, in a nutshell, I would like to wrap up my speech with a few, uh, few more words. Okay, right. Remember that sustainable development is the idea that human society must live and meet their needs without compromising the ability of future generation, as I said before. So earth is a gift, then as a caretakers of the earth, human beings, we should work more on protecting the green and also enhancing the true practices. So I think everyone knows about the dominoes theories. So according to that, uh, accident result from the chain of uh, sequential events, uh, metaphorically like a line of dominoes falling over and over. So we can eventually pass these practices like good practices for saving the earth. Uh, we can pass these uh, traits and practices to the future generation uh, to them to generate a lifestyle which merge uh, all these environmental sectors. So yes, uh, coming to the SDG Youth Challenge, I should talk uh, a bit on that. So 
I think it's a huge success for me personally because uh, I make uh, two of my friends, I convince two of my friends to pledge uh, over this SDG Youth Challenge that mentioned in the bingo. And I also uh, carry out a few activities that mentioned uh, in the bingo itself, like uh, reusing, the, uh, re reusing the plastic bags, uh, uploading the uh, short uh, videos uh, regarding the environmental climate change and so on and so forth. So it's really fun. And for me personally, I believe that practicing green is much more easier than uh, um, practicing a modern lifestyle, which people think it's much more easier and convincing. It's not, it's much more harmful and making people uh, more crazy, more greedy about the nature. So yes, thank you for your time and also for the opportunity. And I make the way to the next speaker. See you again. And don't forget, stay connected. You can find me in Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Just type my, my name and you can connect with me. It won't be a big change if just one practice all the stated points. But uh, I think it will be a huge success for me personally if any of the audience follow at least one point that I mentioned earlier. So yes, that's all. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Shavin. Uh, any question for our speaker? Curry, there's no question, Pazli. No question, yeah. So I have one question for you, Shavin. Uh, as um, a building saving student, uh, how do you foresee uh, sustainable construction uh, in Malaysia in five years' time? Yes, that's actually a crucial question. So let me digest the question first. So as a building serving student, uh, I can see uh, the next five years in our country that uh, we might change, evolve more into the greener side because uh, right now, uh, as the few, uh, previous speakers uh, mentioned, uh, we are having, uh, we are facing towards the climate change and it's drastically uh, impact our, our country itself because we are currently located at the uh, mediator of the earth so we are very much uh, keen to get affected by the climate change itself so i think it will be a huge change in the future uh, especially in our country uh, we might go into a we can we can have a further uh, actions in the greener side so yes i think uh, the greener community will be a bigger community in the future, uh, as I say, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you for sharing that uh, views on, on sustainable construction. So let's move on to our 10th speaker, uh, Ms. Yuvarani Subaramani, from, as well as from University Malaya, on her topic, Enforcing Sustainable Lifestyle Rejuvenates Mother Earth. Uh, please allow me to introduce her. Uh, she's an undergraduate student at Academy of Malay Studies, Yusuf Malaya, majoring in Malay literature, the Sustainable Malayu. So maybe we can learn a lot more from this, uh, from her <laughs> on this. Oh, wow. I've joined. Uh, I mean, she's joined a global citizenship program by Common Purpose and earned a micro credential badge, which demonstrating to the world that the participant has developed the skills to tackle complex global issues. So she has chosen SDG Four Quality Education as a goal in global citizenship program and had done a few steps to tackle this goal, such as organizing tuition classes for affordable price and joined as volunteer tutor in Teach for Malaysia. So uh, without further delay, over to you, Yuva. Thank you for the great introduction. <laughs> so I'll share my screen. Okay. So yeah, I hope you all can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. So a very good afternoon to everyone. And I hope you're doing great and having a fabulous Saturday. So I'm Yuvarani. And today I'm going to present you all about enforcing sustainable lifestyle rejuvenates Mother Earth. And yeah. So before we further uh, do with our topic today, uh, let me do a mind refreshment about sustainable development goals. And as we know, uh, SDGs 
uh, provides a shared blueprint uh, for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. Uh, and 17 SDGs uh, is an actually an urgent call for action by all countries where which is developed and keep developing in a global partnership. And I have chosen SDG for quality education as one of my goal. And what is the reason I chose SDG for it? Because I believe uh, if we have attained SDG 4 and achieve in the correct moment, uh, we can achieve all the SDGs at the same time, where quality education is actually a, a foundation or a basement uh, for all the other SDGs. And I do believe in that, where quality ed education can provide a good um, basement for all other SDGs. And yeah. What is sustainable lifestyle? I think that is the most crucial question that everyone would ask, uh, where a sustainable lifestyle is actually um, a cluster of habit. Uh, yeah. Give me a second. Okay. A sustainable lifestyle is a cluster of habit, actually, and a pattern of behavior that embedded in a society and facilitated by institution, norms, and infrastructures that frame individual choices. And it's actually a sustainable lifestyle is basically meeting um, our basic needs and living well while embracing the idea of sufficiency, right? That is the concept of sustainable lifestyle where um, we inhabit all the a uh, lifestyle which is adored to sustainable development goals. Okay, so yeah, I will sh I will show you examples of sustainable lifestyles. Yeah, there are four examples using reusable straws instead of plastic straws. Um, again, using reusable bags instead of plastic bags, and using energy efficient electrical appliances, and also carpool. Uh, this actually there is a lot of sustainable lifestyle that we can practice in our daily lifestyle, but these are the four examples that I have chosen to show to you all today. Okay, uh, next, how to practice a sustainable lifestyle? Um, it actually depends on us, and it's actually, uh, yeah, it might be hard, but yeah, we can practice in our life. Yeah, the first one, sustainable food chain. Okay, uh, sustainable food chain, why it is one of the sustainable lifestyle? Okay, because uh, a food, Okay, it usually uh, involves production, processing, packaging, and transportation of food is highly dependent on the use of fossil fuels and chemical fertilizers, literally. So they can uh, greatly harm our health and health of environment also. Uh, so sustainable food system operate in a cycle of sustainable production and also support. So literally farmers can limit pesticide usage and treat animals humanly and responsibly uh, in order to attain the sustainable food chain. Okay, these are the uh, list of, uh, what I can say, list of steps to practice the sustainable food chain in our di daily lives, such as do not harm the environment, consume food that is, uh, will not make harm for the environment, support and preserve rural communities, uh, uh, consume food that are healthy and nutritious and that are grown locally. These are the simple steps, but yeah, we don't follow this because we think, oh, this is uh, literally too hard for me to practice and so on. But this is really a simple thing that we can follow in our daily life. Okay, and we're moving on to the second, use alternative transportation. Okay. Uh, why is it advisable to use alternative transportation? Because um, basically the pollutants okay, released by vehicles actually gradually increasing air pollution level uh, and have been connected to adverse uh, health effects. Okay, At the same time, it affects our health, uh, including uh, premature mortality, cardiac symptoms, uh, exacerbations of asthma symptoms, uh, and also diminished lung function. Yes, this is my... Uh, look simple, but it's a what I can say a crucial thing to be honest. So to uh, minimize the damage effect, adopt more sustainable methods of travel. Just like the GIF that I have uh, included in my slides, yeah, we can practice walking and cycling, public transportation using train to go for our work, to go for our um, study places. Okay, carpools, van pools, and all the alternate transportation that we can practice 
to minimize this um, these pollutions, this uh, all the effects that can um, damage our mother earth. Okay. And third one, make green updates at home. Yeah, this one you can practice at home where um, sustainable homes, okay, are not only better for the planet, but also offer opportunity for great cost savings, okay? Uh, where make sure your home is well insulated to conserve energy and spend less on heat and air conditioning. Maybe you can use fan instead uh, of air conditioning. I know the weather is quite hot right now, but yeah, we also sh um, should consider these points so that we can preserve our mother earth, the only one, our mother earth, okay? Use a programmable thermostat to time your heat and air conditioning for when you are in your home, okay? Weatherproof your home, seal or weather strip outside openings to prevent leaks, conserve water by installing aerating and low flow faucets and shower, shower heads, okay? These are the steps that you can uh, practice at your home. And there is also tankless and on-demand water heaters that can save up to 30% of energy compared to uh, standard natural gas tank heaters. Okay, these are the simple steps or maybe might look uh, crucial a bit that you can practice at home, okay? The fourth one, buy green products. Green products that... Uh, that we can buy it's example like yeah like in the picture the bulb that can conserve energy before making a, a purchase or buy something consider the full impact of the products material to our environment or to ourselves and so on okay just consider everything before uh, you buy something raw material that are processed shaped and manipulated consumes energy which result to a depletion of non-renewable natural resources uh, and Transportation of product, including food, using fuel burning vehicle releases carbon emissions and contribute to particle pollution. This is something that uh, we really don't, don't know or we didn't realize. And yeah, I think this is time for us to realize all of these factors before buy something. Okay. And as we know, plastic, glass, paper, and other material may be recycled. And many manufacturers will take products at the end of their lifestyles. Okay. So yeah, consider what parts may be reused and how to dispose of the products or its component responsibly. Right? And yeah, that is a green purchase checklist, okay, uh, that are made of bio-based content. Okay, these are the uh, green products, environmentally preferable, energy efficient or water efficient products, minimal life costs, minimal risk of hazardous chemicals, durable or long product life. Okay, these are the examples of green products that can you buy for your home or for yourself, right? Number five, recycle electronic products. Okay, uh, I'm sure you have a question. Why we should uh, recycle the electronic products that already damage? Yeah, because it is actually harmful if we just throw it just like that, just we dump in the trash bin. Actually, it's kind of dangerous, all right? So electronic impact the environment and human health. Fabricating and shipping uh, electronics use water and energy and often create industrial waste. Okay, these electronic products can uh, cause industrial waste and can leak into the soil or release into the air through burning. It's actually cause pollution and uh, without our realization, all right? Okay, we do not realize that. We may take this thing very simple, but it is actually dangerous, okay? And only through management over the entire life cycle or electronic, uh, we can mitigate the negative effect on our soil, water, air, and health, all right? There are specialized centers for this where you can safely dispose all these uh, non-using electronic products to recycle or to make them reuse, right? These are the ways to recycle electronic products, okay? Now, why is it uh, important to have sustainable lifestyle to our mother earth? Why is it important? Okay, let me show you. 
Becoming sustainable means a reduction in energy usage. Okay, um, it's actually not always, but most operations that start implementing sustainable practices uh, almost immediately notice a reduction in their energy demand. Okay, we can uh, reduce energy in all sort of industries. Okay, that is the first reason why we should practice sustainable lifestyle. Second, overall reduction of operating costs. Um, people, planet, profit means helping out the company, the local environment and those who exist in it. While saving our planet, we can also save our costs. Sustainability is actually more than just improving the bottom line, okay? That is for reduction of operating costs. And third one, yeah, less pollution. We know about that. If we have a sustainable lifestyle, automatically we can uh, reduce the pollution. Biggest benefit here is keeping our environment cleaner and greener and their our dear planet from all sort of pollution. Okay, these are the reasons why we have to practice a sustainable lifestyle, although it is something difficult, something crucial. Yeah, but we have to do it so that we can really take care of our mother earth. Okay. And yeah, that's only for me, but before I end my session, I want to share a saying from Marion Wright Edelman, which is, if you don't like the way the world is, you change it one step at a time. Okay, I really believe the word and one step at a time is actually more than enough to create a huge um, betterment for the world. Okay, to make our earth a better place for next generations and so on. So these are the purely, purely reflection uh, from me throughout this SDG Youth Challenge. And thank you so much for the opportunity. So that's all from me. And any questions? I hope I'm not too fast. <laughs> no, we just have time. Uh, any right. question from okay. our audience? Yeah, any question? Currently, there's no question, Fazbik. No question. I have yeah. one question for you. Okay. Uh, of all the steps, I mean, the tips that you have shared with us. Uh, yes. Which one do you think is the most hardest for, for a layman out there to, to practice? Okay. The <laughs> most hardest for me, I think, it would be sustainable food chains. Yeah, it's Why? quite hard for me. Okay, because... Uh, to be honest, I don't really eat vegetables. I'm not really I, I'm not a fan of vegetables and I don't I won't eat that. So I just started to implement the sustainable food chain in my life where I have to turn myself into a vegetarian vegetarianism. Okay, I want to be a vegetarian and it's quite hard and I just take a, a new step or just started to become a vegetarian. So I think just being a Practicing the sustainable food chain is quite hard for me for now. I think that's difficult. All right. <laughs> okay. So Roberta, maybe me. you can help us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. connect. Uh, I'm going to change all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I really need that. <laughs> all right. Thank you, you. All right. Thank you so right. much. Wonderful. Vegetables are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You should help me, I think. All right. Let's all right. move on thank to you. our 11th speaker, uh, Bentney who is Sichuan from Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Bukit Mertajam, SMK Bukit Mertajam. His topic would be the sacrifice of nature for human survival. Uh, please allow me to introduce him. Um, Bentney or Ben uh, is a mixed child of Chinese father and Indonesian mother, uh, currently studying in SMK Bukit Mertajam, uh, Penang in Form 5. Uh, when he's bored, he, he loves to play video games, read on current world issues, and he loves to cook. Yeah. Uh, after graduating high school, he decided to further his studies in law and hopefully will be able to achieve his dream to be a lawyer and a politician. So uh, without further delay, uh, over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for the introduction. Well, uh, first of all, before I start my little uh, sharing session, I would love to thank uh, Mr. Fazli and team. Uh, everything you did, this whole program is so awesome. Yeah, the, uh, the, the forums, uh, sorry, the webinars, they are so informative. It's, it, it made me, uh, you know, uh, I learned so much from the 
uh, webinars, you know, even things that I never knew, for example, the landfills management system in our, in, our, in Malaysia, where it's not um, only a small percentage of landfills in Malaysia is uh, well managed, and I never knew that. So yeah, uh, so thank you very much. You guys have done a very uh, good uh, program. Now, uh, before I start my little talk, I would love to ask guys a question yeah, uh, regarding my talk. Now, imagine you guys are the uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia in 2040, let's say. And we currently have overpopulation issues and people are out of jobs, uh, we are out of housing uh, areas, people don't have any food. And you know, we don't really have any much areas to develop anymore. But however, as you guys probably know, we do have uh, reserves, yeah, forest reserves in Malaysia. Uh, for example, if I'm not wrong, in Penang, we got the uh, Bukit Benera, I think that's reserved. Okay, so as the Prime Minister of Malaysia, you have to choose whether should you develop uh, our cities into these uh, reserved forests to build housing areas, to build farmlands, to build factories for job opportunities, for consumer needs. But however, if you were to build into these uh, reserves, you will be jeopardizing, you will be sacrificing. Uh, our forest that is full of rich biodiversity, yeah? this uh, forest that is hundreds, even thousands years old. Now, uh, you as a prime minister, what would you choose to do? Would you sacrifice your own citizen, the people who believe, who chose you to become the prime minister to you know, give them uh, housing, uh, job opportunities, food, or would you sacrifice uh, nature? They would you sacrifice these endangered species, these precious tree, trees that is currently helping us to consume these uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. So what is your answer? Yeah. Uh, for me, if you were to ask me this question, I can't really decide. Should I sacrifice my people or should I sacrifice the nature? If I sacrifice my people, it would be like a fascism. Yeah, it'd be a dictatorship country where you know um, I would basically kill a bunch of but my own people, yeah, my Malaysians. But if I were to kill the environment, I will be basically sacrificing both the future of the earth and the future of Malaysia, yeah, because you know it will just keep me back in the face in the future. But so I would not have, uh, I, I, I can't give an answer for this question. But you no, know, I would love to uh, know your opinion on this on this question. What what would your answer be? Now, uh, moving on to my talk, uh, the sacrifice of nature for human survival. Since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, we have done nothing but taking and destroying our nature. You know, We've gone from a species that hunted and gathered uh, in forests to a species that destroyed the earth, that uh, the forest that gave us life. In 2018, only uh, in the whole world, we have lost a total of 12 million hectares of tree cover. And the most importantly, we lost around 3 million hectares of primary forest, which is the size of Belgium, by the way. And primary forests are basically forests which contain crucially important ecosystem and trees. They are hundreds, even thousands years old, basically like in Malaysia, the forest reserves. And they store more carbon than any other forest and are irreplaceable when it comes to sustaining biodiversity. Now, according to global energy and CO2 status reports driven by the higher energy demand in 2018, global energy related uh, CO2 emissions rose from 1.7% to a historic high of 33.1 gigaton CO2, while emissions from all you know, fossil fuel increased. The power sector accounted for nearly two thirds of emission growth. And coal in the power, uh, uh, coal in power alone surpassed the uh, 10 gigatons CO2, mostly in Asia, like uh, China and India. And also the United States accounted for the 85% of the net increase in emission, while emission, of course, it, it also declined in Germany, uh, Japan, Mexico, France, and United Kingdom. It's glad to know that they are actually countries that is you know, uh, trying to decline their carbon emissions. Now, I would love to keep getting to these statistics about how we keep sacrificing the nature, we keep sucking the life out of Mother Earth, but you know, it would be endless, you know, it would be endless how much uh, plastic we throw into the ocean. But ladies and gentlemen, what if for the first time of the human history, we stop, we, 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 we trace our, our footsteps and think, stop thinking of our own survival and start giving back to nature, start thinking back to, uh, to, for, for, for the nature. Because to be honest, it's not very hard to give back and pay back our debt to the environment. First of all, let's reduce the use of plastic products because reducing is so much more important than reuse and recycle. Because like uh, I think the previous speaker said that how 
not all of our plastic products are recycled. Only a small percentage are recycled. So it's best worth to reduce. Next time, go grocery shopping, reuse, uh, bring own reusable bags and refuse their plastic bags that they offer. As stated in the World Council of uh, Number of Plastic Bags Produced, this year alone, 5 trillion plastic bags will be consumed and that's uh, 160,000 uh, per second. And to put that in another uh, form for you to see clearly, uh, if you put it like side to side every plastic bag, that would you know, go around the world for seven times every single hour. And also it covers the twice of the size of France and to walk distance from uh, one end to the other in France, it would take around uh, six days, which means to walk from one end to the other end of this huge plastic pile, it would take around 13 days. Yeah, and that, that, that's a really huge cover of area. Yeah? And in total, we use around 100 million tons of plastic each year, and some percent of uh, the 10% uh, of the plastic end up in the ocean, and estimated 300 million plastic bags every single year end up in the Atlantic Ocean alone. And I'm sure I think you guys know about the you know, huge uh, plastic island that is floating around the Pacific, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, right? And yeah, uh, actually, uh, the funny thing here is uh, one plastic bag, it takes around 1,000 years to decompose, to break down. Yet, for every single plastic bag, it is only used for around 12 minutes of, of, of shopping time. And can you imagine that we are jeopardizing our future just for 12 minutes of ease? And no, I have to admit, the government have done something, have, have, have passed policies to try to reduce the use of plastic bags. For example, the Penang government have now banned plastic bag use every, every Thursday to Sunday this year. Yet, the thing is they have done no effort to enforce this law because I work in a bakery and whenever I refuse to give plastic to the, to the customers, the customers itself, you no, know, we can't just fully blame on the government. The people also, they, they refuse to change because they are, they, they are comfortable while well, using plastic is so much more easier. And the answer I would give, I, I, I would receive whenever I refuse to give plastic bags is that I come on, lah, give one plastic bag. Lah. It's so cheap, man. One plastic bag, like 10 cents only, it, it doesn't cost your company so much, you know? It's so hard for me to, car to, to, to carry this without the plastic bag. And the funny thing is, most of the time, the customer that wants these plastic bags only bought like one or two bread. And it's, to be honest, it's pathetic. It's pathetic that you need a plastic bag that sacrifices your future just for, you know, just to carry bread that you can use your hand to carry. Yeah. So, you know, we need more enforcement from the government and the people to change in order for us to help reduce the plastic bags. It's no use if we just pass policies, but if we don't enforce it. Now, moving forward, the meat industry. I'm sure that I think uh, previously, uh, two speakers have talked about veganism and vegetarianism, but I love eating meat. I love eating a piece of juicy, rare steak, right? But not so surprisingly, beef is the highest carbon emission producing meat, which accounts to almost 300 kilos of CO2 per kilogram of protein produced. As much as I love eating steak, this is a little bit too much, right? The meat industry is one of the biggest contributors to global warming. The feed sourcing, the manure processing releases a ton of greenhouse gases. Millions of acres of lands have been plowed all over the world just to grow feeds for these farm animals. Not to mention the chemicals they use in these fields like fertilizer that will seep into our waterways in, in, in which results of you know, uh, polluting our oceans and our rivers. Now, what I'm trying to say is let's try to reduce the intake of uh, meat, yeah, the meat products, for example, chicken, duck, uh, beef, yeah, because uh, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to convert you to veganism or vegetarianism because I'm not vegan either, but let's try, you know, maybe try to go vegan or vegetarian like you know, once or twice in a week, you know, and not to mention, it is also cheaper to be vegan because, you know, vegetable is cheaper than meat. And who knows, maybe if you love to be vegan, you know, maybe you'll do it like a three or four times and then, you know, later you'll be vegan. I'm trying to be, go vegan actually, but, you know, it's hard because I love to cook and, you know, meat is just delicious, but I'm trying. Yeah? I'm trying for the future of the earth. And so together, let's try. I'm sure we can prevail, yeah? Now, furthermore, the transportation sectors, nowadays people are getting richer and richer and they want to live more comfortable lifestyle, which results of the uh, sales of cars increase. And right now, worldwide, car sales are expected to grow to 71 million automobiles in this year, 2021. Oh, by the way, a typical pa uh, passenger vehicle emits around 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. So if you were to do some fancy math and multiple the number of cars exists, you get into a really, really, really huge number. So 
what I, uh, so what we can do is try to use more public transportation. And in KL, for example, I'm sure most of you guys are from Kuala Lumpur. And one of my favorite things about KL is the transportation system there, the LRTs and the MRTs. It's so easy to get around with these LRTs. And you no, know, I'm actually very confused why most of my friends that live in KL don't really use them, you know, use them that much. It's so easy, you know. Uh, and uh, by the way, if your commute is uh, 20 miles uh, round trip, and if you switch to public transportation, you could lower your covered footprint by 4,800 pounds annually. And as for Penang, where I'm living, the transportation system here is not as efficient because by the time my bus comes to the bus stop, I would be swimming in my own pool of sweat. Yet, however, we can still you know, use other ways to reduce our carbon emission. For example, I've been trying to uh, carpool with my friends whenever I go to school to you know, reduce the uh, carbon emission per person. Nevertheless, the government also should quickly develop our transportation system to you know, make the public transportation more efficient so that we can all change to a public, transport, uh, public transportation uh, lifestyle to reduce the carbon emission. Now, uh, last but not least, of, of course, uh, awareness. Uh, raising awareness. One thing that I love to say is that awareness is just as important as the action you make. Spreading awareness on climate change allows us to share the problems with others to help you combat climate change. Let's be honest here, guys, because if only myself combating climate change, it would be useless. It would be all for nothing. I wouldn't be able to put a dent on climate change. But however, if I were to spread climate, uh, awareness on climate change to 10 people, maybe not all 10 will immediately convert to a uh, sustainable lifestyle, but one, two, or even three people to you know, follow suit, to help, to change, to do more research about sustainable lifestyle. Before I know it, I won't be fighting climate change alone. In, in fact, I will be fighting climate change with three people beside me. And you know, it'll be easier for us to put a dent on climate change. So that's why I think that raising awareness is very important and it's very easy nowadays to raise awareness because it's just a couple touch away and boom, your social media can uh, spread posts about, for example, last year we had the uh, Australian wildfire, the uh, Amazon rainforest, we use uh, social media to spread awareness, you know, to donate money to help them to control the situation. And yeah, it's very important. It's very easy to us to, for us to raise awareness and I'm sure we can do this together. But of course, if you if you all just spread awareness yet refuse to take any action, it would be all for nothing. Yeah, as the saying goes, action speaks louder than words. So let's stop sacrificing our nature. Let's stop giving back. Let's start sacrificing our comfort, our time, our energy, and help to heal our mother nature. Because if we keep if we keep on being stubborn. Before we know it, global warming will have taken a bloody toll on humanity. And don't get me wrong, it has already taken a bloody toll on humanity. Look at the glacier burst that happened in Uttarakhand, uh, India. It caused a massive flood that devastated every single thing it's caused. People lost their homes, their belongings, their cars. And sadly for some, they lost their lives. And in fact, we don't even have to look so far away in India. Yeah, but we can look at Indonesia, where people are living in the coast of Jakarta. They are losing their homes every single year because of the rising sea level. So let's act right now. Let's do something today before it gets closer and closer to us. Even though, yes, we already have seen the consequences in Malaysia. For example, the floods that is happening more frequently than before. So let's do something. Let's do something right now before the consequences take a huge punch in humanity. Let's do something before we, humanity, becomes the first species that causes our own extinction. I'm sure that we can all prevail, right? Because if we still keep on being stubborn, we will have to decide in the future whether we should sacrifice the forest reserves in Malaysia or should we sacrifice the life of Malaysians. Thank you very much. Wonderful, uh, Ben. Uh, you have my vote. <laughs> if you're <laughs> rallying a campaign, uh, you definitely have my vote. All right, over to you, Afan. Is there any questions, maybe? Uh, oh, uh, from Quivlin Boy. Uh, yeah. Which was the collaborative uh, fundraiser by Mr. Peace and Mark? Does this actually help? Yeah. Uh, that, that, 
uh, should we use this example to practice Malaysia lessons the next five years? If I'm not mistaken, uh, the Kementerian uh, Sumber Alam and something something they actually made a um, target to plant. I think hundred million, if I'm not mistaken, like a huge amount of trees to be planted in the next five years. And if I'm not mistaken, it does not do anything. I, I don't think it's not enough to combat of the rate of the deforestation right now. Because uh, right now, every single uh, second, 1,000 something acres of trees are getting cleared out. So I don't think it will be enough. So we need to quickly plant more trees than we are currently you know, uh, cutting down. Yeah, so I don't think it, it, it helps, it helps, but it's not enough. It's just not enough. So we need to keep on planting more and more and more and you know, reduce the rate of us cutting down trees. Yeah, I think that would be my answer. All right, thank you so much, Ben. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Let's move on to our second final speaker of the day, uh, Alif Tukman Asutian from uh, SMK Sri Bintang Utara. Uh, on his topic, climate change and the mentality of our society. So please allow me to introduce him. Um, Alif is a 17-year-old uh, STEM student, uh, team leader and speaker who has campaigned through competitions all around the globe to raise awareness about climate change crisis. Uh, eventually, he, his team has won gold medals and championships in a series of international comp competitions, including the IEA, MyES, MySteve, Big and Build Tape 20. 2021. Despite the fact that SKM is getting closer, his journey doesn't stop there. Recently, he's elected as the Secretary of the Climate Action Program at SMK Sri Bintang Dara, where he has raised awareness among children and adults through a variety of school events, including Microsoft Global Learning Collaboration 2020 and the Climate Action Project, both of which are supported by the Lama, Kun Elizabeth II, Dr. Jen Gurau, World Leaders and his Ministries of Education across 16 countries. So to Alif, the situation isn't important. It's the journey that matters. And all of this transformation begins with the right mindset. So without further delay, over to you, Alif. Uh, thank you so much for the administrator for such an amazing introduction. So first of all, I would like to say thank you so much to, um, to the organizer and administrator for um, understanding the constraints having this thing. Um, <laughs> And I am so grateful to be given a chance to give a speech, okay? So my speech is going to be about um, the, man the mentality of our society, like what kind of, so what kind of mindset that we actually need to tackle this climate uh, crisis, okay? So I'm going to start this um, speech of mine with my childhood, okay? So um, ever since I was a child, okay, I often watch um, Paddington. Okay, Paddington has always been a favorite animation of mine. Okay, it teaches me courage and how people can change. Okay, even as a normal 17 um, student, I my life is pretty normal, it's like a cliche student. But yeah, but the series focuses on Paddington who tries best to save his hometown from a devastating earthquake. So um, you can actually read like that Paddington is actually a refugee who tries to find a new home, okay? And this actually correlates to the reality that we are currently living in to avoid the impacts of climate change, like for example, in the US, okay? But what do we really learn from Paddington? So from Paddington, I learned about stubborn optimism. It is the mindset that turning the reality that we are given by anything, like for example, government, okay, we are given the reality, but we need to change it to the reality that we want. Okay, because today at a global scale, we are facing an acceleration in climate impact. This is due to the fact that, that we are actually, we have procrastinated for way too long because this thing, it has started for way too long. But, you know, like when I joined this program, I never thought I was going to be selected as a speaker. This is owing to the fact that all of the participants are mostly adults. However, just like Paddington, I'm not afraid to try my best as everyone should. Okay. And... Um, Based on a survey by ICES, okay, to the, um, which is to determine the level of awareness in Malaysia, 94.2% of youth, they are aware and they are ready to take action, okay, as this is the last chance for us to truly change our pathway because this is the most decisive decade of human history. It might sound like an exaggeration, but actually it's not. Because um, if we do not act now, we are robbing our grandchildren as well as their descendants from their future and causing them to live 
in a world that is rapidly becoming uninhabitable with rest irreversible ecosystem failures. Okay, but on the contrary side, if we do achieve this goal, we are opening a new door to a new world where cities are greener and the air is fresh and clean. Moreover, job opportunities are abundant and transportation is efficient and the flora and fauna are regenerated and sustainable. And we will have a better future to use the opportunity that we have. Okay, and there will be a lot of changes that we will be doing. Okay, that will be made in the next nine years. And okay, before the global summit in 2030. Okay, but each of us will be taking steps along the way. Okay, unfortunately, we are not quite there yet. Okay, as all of the transformation begins in one place, which is our mindset. Okay, so what kind of mindset do we really have here locally? So allow me to give an example. So I'm trying to make this um, non-political, but in 1996, okay, Malaysia had been struck by a total national blackout, okay, that left many people living in the dread of darkness, okay, so because the first thing that you would do in order to attack the country is to attack the electrical system, especially at night, okay, because you can't basically use anything in your household, okay, so what went wrong, you might ask, okay, um, if you ask the authorities, you will likely to receive responses such as, definitely, definitely, it was all an act of God, okay, so, this also includes um, the Highland Towers tragedy to the most current um, coronavirus pandemic to the most recent uh, landslide happening plant that. And if you were to ask, um, all the responses were simply brutal, but it was all an act of God. Thus is this mindset where everything is an act of God and nature is to be blamed for the natural phenomenon suitable for us to tackle the climate change. Okay, so, it's not actually about the society. It's also about the leader because even the leader is having this kind of mindset. So if the leader have this kind of mindset, is it who else couldn't be more shocked by those kind of response? Like when you explain it in the Dewaraya and you say that it is an act of God, that is actually bizarre. Okay, because when faced with these facts, okay, about this climate change, we either have few options. First, we can either be indifferent and do nothing and hope that the problem goes away on its own, like most of us did. Or we blame Mother Nature and God for the impact of human activities by stating that we are too powerless to intervene. Or we can be a stubborn optimist who, who no matter how hard or difficult is the journey, we must and we must choose to tackle the climate crisis, okay? So optimism is not simply about um, blindly ignoring the reality that surrounds us, okay? That is foolishness, okay? And it's not also about um, naive faith where everything will be taken care of nature, even if we do nothing. Well, that is recklessness. The form of optimism that I'm referring to is the positive mindset in which we visualize our desired future and actively works towards it, okay, motivating us to make a difference. Indeed, from here, all of this it has nothing to do with God, but it is our own minds, our own decision to act upon. We know that the reality of all producing um, industry will not shut down in the next nine years. But what we learn from studying landmines and nuclear energy is that the journey matters, okay? And talking about it frequently with our family members and friends is creating new conversations and new climate ambitions. And these kind of discussions lead to big ideas. And at this point of human history, we need those big ideas. Okay, so in 2021, millions of people have lost their homes and thousands have died as a result of fires, floods, landslides, and heat waves that swept the entire planet. Yet we still have the audacity to believe that it was all nature's will. So this situation might be overwhelming for some of us, but we as human beings, we are capable of making enormous changes in our lifetime. Like for example, recently, I had a conversation with a teacher of mine when I was out of school and overwhelmed. And she said to me, do you realize how much the world has changed? In my time, we didn't even have cell phones or computer. The idea of robotics and innovation didn't cross our mind and the thought of flying is impossible. 
She told me that the world has changed dramatically in her lifetime, such as how we travel and communicate, and so as yours. So when I'm creating this awareness, I am, I am holding to this idea that one day I'm going to sit down on an armchair at a and telling all my grandchildren, okay, about the mindset that we used to have, as well as the journey to this new lifestyle, because I believe in a future where the world is a better place. So as a conclusion, Optimism is it's not the perfect, but it is the best mindset that for us to have in tackling climate change. But the journey as a stubborn optimist is not going to be easy as we will stumble along the way. Because these nine years, okay, before 2050 is going to be a very it's going to be a very rough journey. Okay. Uh, and Christiana Figueres, which is a Costa Rican diplomat, once said, optimism cannot be a sunny day attitude. It must be relentless, okay? And we can actually start our journey of changing our mindset by thinking about the environment with empathy and challenge. So you could jump up out of your bed and feel challenged and hopeful. So one of the things that I feel important to remind ourselves is that climate change and pollution are caused by the actions of irresponsible humans, not God or nature. So, and that is all the takeaways that I want you guys to remember. And that is all from you. Thank you so much. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> uh, optimism is the key word. Sir. All right. Um, any question from our audience for Ali? Oh, there's no question, Fazli. No question. I have yeah. one question. Um, based on your bio, you did mention that. Uh, can you explain a bit more on the Microsoft Global Learning Collaboration 2020? Program yes. as well as climate action project that you have. Yeah. So this climate action project it was actually conducted worldwide in order to celebrate the Earth Day. So it was actually fun because it involved all the political politicians from all over the world. So um, Microsoft um, Global Learning Collaboration is more on shaping the problems in our country, but the climate action project is actually where we do more, where we share our opinion and we raise awareness among different countries. Like for example, in my school, we are selected to raise awareness among ASEAN countries. So that's what we did. And then um, during the um, announcement ceremony, um, all of the speaker, like for example, um, Prince Esmeralda of, I'm not sure which country she's from. Yeah, so everyone is involved, okay? Um, the politician and they share their view on climate change, even Prince William, and I find it very, very nice. But for me personally, I'm not really, um, because when it comes to the climate action project, it just involves adults. But personally for me, I spend most of my time in another events that uh, raise awareness among children, okay, especially in India, because you know when it comes to adults and India, I mean adults and children, okay, they have different kind of, uh, we are thinking also a different kind of mindset because when it comes to children, they're actually very keen of learning. But sometimes when you raise awareness among adults, they are um okay, so uh yeah, that's all about the climate action project. It's a very um it's a project that was organized. I'm not sure who organized it, but it was supported by all of these people and all of the ministry from all around the world. So yeah. So how many members are there in your team? So in my Look, team, they are around 20 people. 20 people? Yeah. So it's so like what, a chosen. Yeah, uh, that's wonderful. So we'd like to love, uh, we'd like to learn more about that uh, maybe in our future program. Yeah, Alif? Thank you. Uh, let's move on to our final speaker. So please bear with us. This is our final speakers of the day. Um, Ms. Pe Yongjin from University of Malaya uh, with her topic, uh, Sustainability Mindset, the Mind and Soul. So please allow me to introduce her. Uh, she has devoted uh, most of her free time trying to find out what is wrong with our system uh, or, and will there really be a day when the cure for social and environmental issues is developed. She's currently a deputy president of the NGO My Plasticology, where uh, they thrive to fight plastic pollution with education. She's not a professional, but most importantly, uh, she care and she wants to help others realize that they should care too. So during her journey in finding the answer 
uh, she came across this white paper uh, playing to tie adopting to a sustainable mindset uh, might might be that something that she's missing in her solution so over to you uh Pei Yongjin. hi everyone good afternoon and thank you um sir Fadli, for the wonderful introduction uh can you guys hear me clearly because it's actually raining here and i'm not so sure if my line's okay yep okay yeah all right, uh, uh, that's great. So also I want to thank you uh, to UMCARES, RC Central, uh, Simananjong, and also UMSDSN for giving me this great opportunity. All right, so I'm going to start uh, with my experience in SDG Youth Challenge. I'm going to make it quick because I know that most of us are waiting for lunch, right? All right, so uh, when I joined this SDG Youth Challenge, I think that uh, the greatest thing is that uh, it challenges my comfort zone. And um, especially the video, the video taking thing, and also the sharing session, and which is how I actually came across this white paper because I was doing some research and I found this white paper and I started getting really interested. All right, so I'm going to jump into what I want to present today. And um, before I start, uh, okay, I'm going to make a very, very big disclaimer. All right that I am not a professional and what I say will not represent uh, the thoughts of the author and also what I share is only what I think and understand and also I want to welcome every one of you to challenge your thoughts and also my thoughts and you can voice them out in the chat and we can explore about it more together and after I end my session I'll share my uh, email and also my insta so that you can hit me up if you want to talk about it also all right so uh, as I continue, let me share to you a little bit about myself, what did I do and uh, how did I get into this, all right. So uh, actually, I feel like uh, I live, right, uh, the speaker, the 12th speaker, yeah, I was like really, I think it's really good that you guys are exposed to all these kind of events uh, during high school because I didn't get the chance and what I did was after high school, after I graduated high school with and what uh, I want to like make some changes to my high school. I just want uh, to help them go to a more sustainable pathway. So I just gathered a, a group of friends and then, yeah, we just say like, okay, so what can we do to start small, like start from our school and then maybe someday we can go further, right? All right, so we actually started and then uh, we named our group the change because we want it to be a real change. And then um, everything was going smooth until MCO hits and everything just went to waste. And okay, so uh, what I'm trying to tell you about uh, today in my talk is about sustainability mindset. And so why am I bringing in this the change thing that I brought? Because, because um, after going into MCO state and after not, the feeling of not being able to do anything is really, really um, depressing and it's like, um, I'm sure that some of you here has been doing all this kind of work and you've been uh, experiencing burnouts, you've been experiencing like um, disappointment and stuff like that. And sometimes we just can't reach our goal and we feel like, yeah, I'm kind of use useless because like, you know, I just can't do uh, that something that I want to do. All right. So, um, and also because after we graduated high school and we actually shift into these NGOs or like anything, uh, it's not high school anymore and there's no teachers or like, you know, the school there to be protective over you. Yeah, you just have to bear some pressure on your own and sometimes it's really, really suffocating. And also because, um, yeah, uh, as uh, Mr. Fadli also mentioned that I'm in this plastic, my plasticology NGO. So what we do is we fight this plastic pollution. It's actually plastic abuse, actually. Like, um, it's not that we cannot use plastic at all because if you look around, most of the things are made out of plastic, like even your vehicles. Yeah, you can't say that I don't want plastic, right? Yeah, so uh, it's a very hard thing to actually cut off plastic. But what we, can, we want to do is to stop abusing the use of plastic. Yeah, okay. So uh, there was this time when I came across this scholarship <laughs> which is a petrochemical company. So I had this, um, this struggle that I feel like I might be competing myself if I join because it's, you know, I'm making plastic when I'm refusing plastic, right? So I actually had like this talk with uh, my Greenpeace 
uh, fellow seniors. Um, that, yeah, so they were saying that it's not, um, from what I, uh, after I talked to them, I realized that it's not about uh, what I do now. It's all about the mindset. It's like, if I go into a plastic company, I know what are they doing and I might change with, from within something like that. So it's not always about the surface of what we do, all right? So enough of the of my past. Okay, I'll just get to my point, okay? I'll just get to uh, start my talk for today. So uh, this white paper is called uh, Playing to Thai, Adopting to a Sustainable Mindset, all right? So what is sustainable, sustainable mindset anyway? So in this white paper, it mentions that we want to shift our desire to win into a desire to sustain, all right? It's like when you're in a relationship and you're fighting with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you don't want to win the argument just to break up, right? You want to actually talk it out so that your relationship can be sustained. So you can uh, see the, the idea behind, behind it. And actually as environmentalists or just people who care, we always have this desire to win. Maybe it's because of our, you know, Asian cultures or something, right? We just want to be the best in everything we do. And that we just think that we have a very noble goal and we want every, everyone to follow. Yes, that's correct at some point. As in like, uh, maybe you are morally correct or you are like factually correct some, sometimes, okay? But um, our mindset is actually making a very big difference when we want to win the conversation, want to win this battle instead of, uh, trying to um, help everybody understand what we are doing. So that is where this mindset comes in as, uh, all right, so I'm going to talk about how you, how, you, how you help others see the things that you see later, okay? But I will start with self-sustainability, all right? So sustainability is not just about environment. It's not just about, you know, like uh, how we can uh, have food after how many years, no. Sustainability is a really, really general topic and it, it's just like revolving around everything, okay? So for ourselves, just like I mentioned just now, if I get so many burnouts and sometimes I just get too tired that I feel I want to cry, right? If I keep getting these kind of emotions, how, how am I sustainable for myself? I'm not even sustainable as in like, I cannot get my life going uh, smoothly. Okay, not to mention smoothly because nothing is smooth in life, but I cannot keep doing this because uh, I feel too much uh, negative emotions or I, like we just cannot, uh, how do you say that? It's like a very big toll on ourselves when we do this. So it already makes us unsustainable. And you know, on a, when you're on a plane, right? They usually tell you if like there's a crashing of the plane, you need to save yourself before you save others. So in this case, you, you already can't save yourself. How do you expect yourself to save others? Yeah. So Okay, um, and actually in this uh, white paper, it mentioned about uh, this, we do so much things like we have all these beach, beach cleanups, we have all these campaigns, uh, we have all these, you know, all these events that we held, but uh, eventually, what is, the, what is the final thing that we actually get? So it actually leads me to my first quote of the white paper. Everything runs shallow and nothing substantial is changed. So we actually clean up the beach for one time. Okay, let's say November, we clean it up. And then the next January, when we visit the beach again, it's like full of garbage again. So um, is that really a change that we have made there, even though we spend so much time, so much energy, so much money on this uh, particular beach cleanup? Yeah, so... Um, and actually, people tend to feel good, like as in after you watch this documentary about how you can, uh, you know, how you can provide, how you can contribute to a better world. And then you just feel like, whoa, yeah, that's going to be my future. I'm going to do so much and I'm going to be great. And then after that, they just walk out and just continue our lives. Just like how sometimes we uh, just lose our motivation and like we just don't feel like it matters to me. Uh, I think one of our speakers mentioned just now about climate, uh, climate crisis, right? It's, um, it's like as if we cannot feel the, the, the effect, effect, effects and so we feel like it's not relatable to us. Yeah, so that is 
one of the reasons why people don't actually care that much, all right? And sometimes things are so hard for us, uh, especially in uh, when we are trying to solve these kind of issues. And wait, ah, uh, let it load first. <laughs> all right, so what should we do to help ourselves to be more sustainable, all right? So quoting the white paper again, our end goal is not grounded in the need to forge ahead. Means that our goal is not to win this battle. We are not here to say that, yes, I'm the best, I'm the environmentalist, I'm not. Like, uh, it's the same thing as uh, titles don't really matter when you're trying to do something, even though they do sometimes. But it's just that your mindset on your end goal is not to, like, I want to win. But then uh, you actually stop trying uh, stop trying to ask if oh can i really change this world because as, as i mentioned sustainability is not just about environment right so maybe it's like from a social perspective to say oh can poverty really end if i do this 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 or like can uh, the economy crisis really end if like um people get more work and if i actually do this kind of campaigns will they get more decent work or just environment uh, as i many of us before here uh, we mentioned so many uh, ways that we can cure this problem, right? So um, it is really, really hard for that one particular event or one, like planting trees, uh, it's going to be helpful, but it's not going to be curing the root of this uh, whole entire situation. Yeah, so it doesn't mean that I'm saying that we shouldn't do that. It's just that uh, we shouldn't feel that it is, the only solution is the cure for everything. Yeah. So which leads to the next thing that um, what is mentioned is that we need to have genuine, genuine uh, sustainability. As in like, we, we will consider the long haul instead of just the short term. As in, we don't want to have only one beach cleanups. We want to uh, make sure that people stop throwing garbage everywhere. We want to make sure that people stop, you know, just doing anything that isn't right all right so how do they actually um how do they actually follow what we want okay i will continue about that later all right so from from now uh if you actually accept that okay i can have a lot of time i, uh, I can consider long haul so you don't have to pressure yourself so much. Like uh, sometimes you just set a goal, like now it's uh, October, right? Like sometimes you just set like, okay, January, I want to have a campaign on like uh, no plastic. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, maybe nobody in Selangor will ever use single use plastic bags again. Yeah, so that's my goal. So with this thing, you're actually pushing yourself so hard and then like, you can't really, you kind of like lose sight of what you actually want, you know? It's like this big picture, but then you just look at a small dot and then you make yourself suffocate and maybe during the December time and then you feel like you're too busy and you're too tired and you just kind of want to give up. So, so if we actually adapt to this sustainable mindset, we can help ourselves to have this time to rediscover ourselves also. As in, we have like all those compassion and all those uh, qualities for ourselves and we can actually go further with all these qualities, if you get what I mean, all right? And uh, as mentioned by Davina, our first speaker, we, uh, if we are doing things alone, it's uh, so much harder and it's going to be uh, so much depressing than having a group of people doing this together. So um, it's like, uh, how, do I say, how do I say that? It's like, um, it's like just right now, having all of us here, all those panelists and all our participants, I feel like, yeah, everybody gets what I say. Do you, mean? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and uh, from here, we can see how, how we actually grow slowly and we can actually envision a, a sustainable future instead of just, because like for now, uh, what we think is like, okay, what problem do we have? We have this forest fire, we have this plastic pollution. So like, honestly, when we think of this, um, I'm not sure about you, but for me, when I think about this, I can only see the future. Okay, the plastic pollution is going to get more, get higher, and yeah, maybe our climate, uh, climate issues is going to get worse, something like that. So, but if we actually shift ourselves 
to a more sustainable mindset, we can see how it can turn out, how actually everything will unfold uh, by time. All right, so why is it really important for us to have this sustainable mindset, okay? So going on to our next quote. Um, okay, it's working really slow. Okay, going on to our next quote. We must understand that only when we are sustainable in life and living because we can address the problems around us. Uh, it's just like what I said just now, all right? And it's like when we feel healthy and connected, only can we make real changes. So when I feel that, um, yes, I'm... I can do this uh, practice daily routine uh, in a very nice way. Just like, uh, just I forgot the name of the speaker, but yeah, she mentioned about veganism. Yeah, so she's very comfortable with doing that. And from there, she can help others. It's not like, let's say for me, I cannot, I cannot do veganism yet. Like, because I, I really love meat also. Like, okay, because uh, it's like a, a habit for me also. So if you want me to promote veganism, this is like super hard, okay? Because I'm not even comfortable with it yet. And I can't really, uh, you know, maybe you can say preach that to the others. And also from uh, Asni's video that he shared. So it actually relates to one of the parts mentioned in this white paper. As in, if you have greed, you have ability, and you have knowledge, you can actually lead to ruin. As in like, if one person has this, all this knowledge, all this ability, and then he has greed so he has the power to ruin everything like uh just like a video he showed just now like look at the world that we have made uh, with all this knowledge and ability and it is actually human nature to be greedy and selfish because you know humans are usually trying to survive all right and i'm not going to go to the psychology part okay so let me continue okay this is uh the last part that i'm going to share all right bear with me for a bit Okay, so how do we help others see from a sustainability mindset? How do we help others uh, see from what we see? Okay, so this white paper is actually all about playing to tie. We don't want to win this battle. Okay, not like don't want, but our main goal is not to win. What we want is to play to tie. Um, what do I mean play to tie actually? Because when I first read this sentence, I was like, what does it mean anyway? Okay, so... Um, what we actually want to do is to seek to understand, but not necessarily, not necessarily agree, okay? And the difference of uh, us and others are the fact, okay? The difference are acknowledged and difficulties are negotiated, all right? So you cannot tell people that, no, you cannot do this because uh, I think what I say is correct, no. But what you can do is you can see from their perspective and you acknowledge what, um, what, uh, what difference do we have. And then from there, you can see what are the gaps that we need to, uh, you know, we need to overcome and what are, what are the main difficulties that we are facing. And from there, instead of doing isolation, alienation and exploitation, we should always consider awareness, integration and cooperation which is why we are all doing this, all these awareness campaigns and stuff like that. And we really want people to feel like uh, we are recognizing the individual and also the whole, the individual as in like um, every single person is important, okay? Nobody is left out and it's not that I am more superior to you, no. Because most of us here actually uh, to, to admit or not, okay, any, it's like, you feel that it's not you, so yeah. It's just like most of us here, we tend to want to want people to follow us. Like we feel like yes, what I what I'm doing is correct, but what you're doing is wrong. All right, so that's actually a little bit of superiority that we are imposing on other people, and most people do not actually want to follow you because we do we ask them to. Yeah, okay. So just to share, like there was this one time that me and my brother, we went to Tapao, uh, like just mixed rice, and suddenly he asked me, uh, why, can, why can't we take this one straw? Like from, because you know, they have this tea, right? So why can't we take this one straw? So he was like, I, I'm only taking one straw. So he asked me, uh, why can't I like that? So I just tell him that, oh, because if you take one straw and then 
10 million people taking one straw every person. So in the end, there's going to be 10 million straws used and then 10 million straws are going to a landfill, something like that. So it's like trying to help people understand what we, what we see and understand the pros and cons. And actually the sustainability mindset is not just about solving social problems, solving environmental problems. It's actually, uh, it's like from what perspective you're standing, let's say I'm standing on a company's perspective, I can totally use this mindset as in like, I want to uh, make sure that my company keep going on sustainably. And also so that I will make decisions based on my mindset. Uh, and from there, we understand what we are facing and we can actually, the whole team will be facing this problem together. Yeah. So that's about all I'm going to share. And the time is really, uh, it's really late already. Yeah. Just um, before I end, just a side note to Mr. Fadi, because I, I heard that you asked uh, another speaker about what we can improve on this SDG event. So I was thinking actually we might have uh, more interactive sessions for us because it's, re it's a really hard, uh, I mean, hard, hard opportunity that we get uh, to actually meet up with so many passionate youth. And I feel like if we get to interact more, like maybe have some bit sessions or something, just, yeah, just, you know, and yeah, it would be really good. And also uh, to Alif, which uh, the speaker before me. So I heard you mention that uh, all of us here are adults or something. But yeah, no, I don't think I don't think so lah. Because I think actually age doesn't really matter. Like I'm year one of uh, of my studies and I'm nineteen. All right. So and when I started going into this was when I actually graduated high school and I actually meet up with, meet up with lecturers like senior lecturers in some way. And I really I really think that. Age is not the thing that matters in these uh, social issues. And I just want to thank, uh, thank all of you, uh, all the speakers before me, because I feel like uh, I've learned a lot from you. And thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Safazi. All right. Thank you. Wonderful uh, sharing session on mindset, uh, Leong Jin. Um, is there any question from the floor? Let me check. Yeah, yeah we have one question for you. Uh, in your opinion, what are the ways for people to be more sustainable? For example, starting from home, will it be difficult for them? Um, thank you for the question. So to be more sustainable, I believe that most of our speakers has mentioned like uh, transport, like, you know, the appliances and even our own bingo challenges. Uh, okay, so the thing about the bingo challenge, uh, I can share it to you. Uh, I think some, some speaker mentioned also just now, but yeah, um, there's this like maybe turn off electrical appliances and there's this uh, uh, bringing recycle back. So will it be difficult for them? Actually, I feel it's not difficult. Um, if you have this, uh, if, if you really want to change that, like it's going to be really hard for you if you don't feel like changing because like you just want to use you just want to open all your electrical appliances. You just want to, you know, enjoy like like for now. I'm open. I'm I'm using one lamp here instead of opening all the lamps behind. You know, you get what I mean. So it's actually a choice that you make. Uh, if if you want to say if it's difficult or not, yeah, that's all from me. Does that un answer your question? Hi. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 All right. But yeah. if anything, you yeah. can. If yeah, anything, you... you can feel free to. Yeah. Hit me up. Yep. Sure. You can share your contact in the chat box, Jim. All right. All right. Congrats. Thank you for the uh, comment on what can we improve. Uh, well, to be honest, actually, this uh, SGU's challenge is, is actually developed and are designed. Uh, to be made into physical mode, but then due to MCO, <laughs> we have to shift everything into virtual uh, format. So, I'm I'm sorry for that. Yeah. So this is the the, the least that we could do uh, to get everyone uh, together. So, thank you, Peng Jin. All right. Hi. Um. Now we have come to the end of our uh, symposium. I think. Uh, 
uh, all of us have learned a lot uh, from uh, and I hope all of us have enjoyed and gained new knowledge and tips and hacks and, and advice on how to practice sustainable lifestyle in our daily life from all our wonderful speakers. So please uh, join me to thank all our, our awesome speakers uh, from University of Malaya, uh, from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, from SMK Sri Bintang Utara, and SMK Bukit Metajam. Uh, so all these 13 speakers uh, coming from this wonderful uh, organization, I'm pretty sure uh, you're making your universities and schools proud. Yeah. So on behalf of the organizers, uh, UMCAS, RCE Central Semenanjung, and UMSDSN, we'd like to thank all participants and members of the MSDU's Challenge 2021. Uh, we'd like to apologize for any technical issues or shortcomings from our end. Um, the, the final result of the top three speakers, we will announce it later on through our uh, media platform, uh, social media platform, Instagram, Facebook page of ecocampus.uni Malaya. So all participants will soon receive your e-certificates of participation uh, through the link that we will share on the chat box. Yeah. So I hope you, you guys can see that. Uh, without, uh, before we end our uh, symposium, we would like to have all our speakers to switch on your video. We would like to have a quick uh, snapshot of group photo. Can we have Yuva, Roberta, Azmi, Ayn, if you're <laughs> okay now, Sharvin? How about as me? Can you turn on your camera? Charvin, are you there? Or you, you're having your lunch? <laughs> All right. Uh, I think I leave. Uh, it's not here. Oh, your camera is not working. No worries. No worries. OK. Um, All right. Put up your best smile, okay? In the count of, uh, hold on. In the count of three, one, two, three. Hold on. All right, one more. Freestyle. One, two. Three. All right, wonderful. Okay, uh, before we end uh, our symposium, uh, I would like to uh, share with you that the result, again, uh, the result, the final result will be uh, shared uh, through our uh, Facebook page and as well as Instagram. But, and the recipient of the best report uh, we'd like to congratulate uh, Davina and Raja for the best uh, report. So congrats. So we will share your report with your permission to the rest of the uh, speakers and as well as our participants so that they, they could learn something from your report. Yeah. So congrats, Davina. So uh, I hope uh, all the audience have already, uh, you know, are completed the uh, feedback form in order for you to uh, redeem your e certificate and we end this session with this poll okay we're just wondering whether people are aware of this uh, topics and issues.
So for our speakers, uh, your token of appreciation will be posted to you, uh, to your address. So please share your address in our WhatsApp group. Uh, we'll post it to you uh, for, for only for non UM <laughs> speakers, okay? <laughs> for UM speakers, you have to come and collect yourself, uh, okay? Uh, at our office, we will announce it the, the date and time soon. Okay. All right. So I think that's about it. Uh, I think we have such a wonderful Saturday morning. They're up to almost two now. So please enjoy your lunch. Please stay safe and have a great weekend to all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Fadli. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend, too. Thank you, Mr. Fadli. Thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone.